Welcome to a brand new episode of Citizen Detective. I'm one of your hosts, Mike Morford. My friends call me Morph. I host or co-host several true crime podcasts, including Criminology, The Murder of My Family, Missing Persons, and Zodiac Speaking. And just want to tell everyone up front, if you want to leave us a voicemail about this case or any case or we've covered, you can do so by going to speakpipe.com slash citizen detective. Leave us a voicemail. We may play it on the air. And also, I want to give you a heads up. If you have any need to find out what's going on with the show, find old episodes, find links to social media, news on the podcast, any of that, you can go to citizendetectivepodcast.com to find out what's going on. So with all that, I'm going to turn you over to Alex. Hey, I am Alex Ralph, researcher and writer for Citizen Detective. I'm a law grad with almost two decades of experience in criminal law. I've worked both prosecution and defense in homicides, sexual assault cases, and other violent crimes. And of course, I wanna let everyone know where to find us. We record live every two weeks on YouTube on twitch.tv slash citizen detective, twitter.com slash citizen dpod, and facebook.com slash citizen detective podcast. So let's go to Lee. I'm Lee Meller, a.k.a. The Doc, Doc Murder. I'm a criminologist, author of seven books, uh, former VP and head of behavioral for the American Investigative Society of Cold Cases. And tonight I'm doing double duty. Um, our switcher, the guy that moves all of the slides in and out, Drew, he's busy with something else. So um, go easy on us. Um, I'll be behind the scenes. And you can come behind the scenes with us, too, at patreon.com slash citizen detective uh when we have the scrum which is like our after hours so go there become a patron of the show find the link and click it and you can join us every two weeks for uh scrummage now uh we had a, an interesting and flattering comment that we wanted to uh read out and uh and thank the person who gave it do you want to read that out alex Sure. This is from Roxanne H. And she says, thank you for what you do. The unique combination of expertise and perspective from Cloyd, Doc, and Susanna makes your podcast special. I would encourage you to emphasize their contributions as much as possible. I personally would like to hear about the cases they find the most memorable or still solvable. That'd be a great nope. idea for an episode. And thank you very much for the compliment. Unfortunately, uh, there's no Cloyd or Susanna tonight, but Doug McGuire is here to do geo profiling. Um, Cloyd's in like, like Lake Tahoe right now, so yes, he is. I don't want to drag him away from from that fun. Okay, so we are doing an interesting case this time around, but we have uh, an important item to get to yes. ahead of time. Alex, why don't you take care of this too? Yeah. So Angie Montgomery um, reached out to us. Now Angie was our guest on when we covered the Hopper Road cases some time ago. And she is putting out the word on a missing person in Ohio. 16 year old Whitney Hatfield has been missing since March 7th from South Salem, Ohio. She was last seen on the 4600 block of Main Street. Whitney disappeared under suspicious circumstances and her family believes that she is with a man that she met online. There's been no activity on her social media, media and no contact with her family since she vanished. Whitney is five foot three inches tall, 120 to 125 pounds. She has black or brown hair and brown eyes. She was last seen wearing a dark colored t-shirt and light colored jogging pants. The National Center for Missing and Exploited Children is treating this case as a human trafficking abduction. So if anyone out there has any information about Whitney, please contact the Ross County Sheriff's Office at 
1186. Now, Angie did contact us about doing an episode on Whitney. And I told her we had, you know, some episodes lined up. She's going to get me all the information and hopefully we can get uh, the word out there, do an episode and shed some more light on this case and help find this little girl. Uh, but for now, shall we move on to today's case? Yes, absolutely. Okay, let's do it. So I'll get us started. Uh, between the winters of 1976 and 1977, four children from Oakland County, Michigan, were abducted and murdered. Their bodies left in different locations around the Detroit suburbs. The victims were two boys and two girls, all between the ages of 10 and 12. At least three of the victims were suffocated within hours before their bodies were found and one was shot in the face. The boys were sexually assaulted, but the girls were not. Sources claim that in each case, the killer took great care of the victims during their captivity, feeding them and keeping them clean. These sources state that the killer or killers washed the victims and their clothing before discarding the bodies. Other sources claim that this is not the case, that only one of the bodies showed evidence of being cleaned. The investigation lasted almost a year before the discovery of the last victim. Hundreds of individuals were questioned, and none of them were charged in any of the cases. Almost 30 years later, a new investigation revealed shocking information, including the investigation of a massive child pornography ring and damning statements by, checks by child sex offenders who were initially cleared in the murders. The Oakland County child killings have been the subject of several books, including The Snow Killings by Marnie Richard, by Marnie Richard Keenan, and J. Reuben Appleman's The Kill Jar. In 2019, Children of the Snow, a two-part series on the murders, aired on the Investigation Discovery Channel, bringing new attention to the cases. Tonight, we're going to focus solely on the crimes, after which Doc will analyze the individual murders, the crime scenes, and the type of offender responsible. Next time, we'll discuss the investigations, the suspects, and evidence in the case that was ignored for decades. Douglas McGregor is here tonight to discuss the geographically relevant aspects of the case, which we think are critical to understanding how the Oakland County child killer chose, abducted, and held the victims before killing them and discarding their bodies. And next time, Cloyd and Suzanne will be here to share their thoughts on the suspects and the inv original investigation. We have a ton of information to unpack, so let's get right to Alex to get things started. 12-year-old Mark Stebbins was a perfectly all-American Midwestern boy. He lived in Ferndale, Michigan with his mother, Ruth Stebbins, and his older brother, Mike. Ruth was divorced from the boy's father, Lester, and had full custody of the boys. Mark was a seventh grader at Lincoln Junior High School who loved baseball and fishing. Like many young boys, Mark was heavy into the military. In fact, his dream was to grow up and join the Marines. In the early afternoon of February 15, 1976, the day after Valentine's Day, Mark Stebbins went to the American Legion Hall with his brother to play pool. Ruth was a bartender at the hall and was at work while the boys were there. The hall was located at 10 Mile Road in Livernois Street, about three blocks from the Stebbins' home on East Saratoga. After a while, Mark was bored and wanted to go home to watch Destination Tokyo, a war movie starring Cary Grant. At approximately 1.15 p.m., Mark said goodbye to Mike and Ruth and headed back to his house. Mike returned home later and Mark wasn't there. When Mark was still not home at 11 o'clock that night, Ruth reported him missing. Police searched the area looking for a five-foot-tall boy with strawberry blonde hair and blue eyes. At the time of his disappearance, Mark was wearing a blue parka with a hood, a maroon sweatshirt, Levi's jeans, and black rubber boots. Police went door to door looking for the missing Ferndale boy. The search turned up nothing. No one with whom police saw police spoke saw Mark at any point on his way home from the American Legion Hall. Officers even looked into the Shrine Circus, which left Detroit that Sunday. Nothing. At approximately 11.30 a.m. on Thursday, February 19th, four days after Mark vanished, Mark Bo Botemeyer, excuse me, Mark Botemeyer, left work at the Fairfax Plaza in Southfield, about two miles west of the American Legion Hall. As he walked through the parking lot toward the neighborhood strip mall, he spotted the, what he thought was a mannequin. The doll was lying in the snow next to a four-foot brick wall. Bodemeyer walked closer and realized that he was looking at the dead body of a young boy. The boy was Mark Stebbins. Mark was still dressed in the clothes he was wearing when he disappeared. His body laid face up, 
and his hands were crossed across his chest. The parka's hood was up, covering the back of Mark's head. Oakland County Deputy Medical Examiner Dr. S Dr. Thomas J. Patigna performed Mark's autopsy. Dr. Patinga concluded that Mark died of asphyxiation by suffocation. Patigna also found rope burns on Mark's wrist and legs, indicating he was bound for a significant length of time before his death. Autopsy also revealed that Mark was repeatedly sodomized. Reports, reports aren't clear as to whether the, there was semen present inside Mark's anal cavity, but Patinga found no presence of semen on his body, in his underwear, or on his clothing. Two small lacerations on the left rear of Mark's scalp had begun to scab. The lacerations were circular in shape and close together, resembling the edge of a double-barreled shotgun. Blood from the lacerations was present inside the hood of Mark's parka. Many sources claim that all four victims were meticulously cared for. These sources state that each victim was well-fed, thoroughly cleaned, and their clothing was washed. But this is a myth, according to Kathy Broad, sister of the fourth victim, Tim King. Kathy claims that Mark's body was, quote, not exceptionally clean. His outer clothing was clean, but his underwear had neither been changed nor washed for days. Matt Gallup was walking his dog around the perimeter of the parking lot at about 9.30 that morning. His schnauz... I'm sorry. Pardon me. Was it not Matt a Gallup schnauzer? Yeah, we are, we are with <laughs> Mitte Schnauzer. Uh, I thought I deleted a section and I did not, so my apologies to everyone. Matt Gallup was walking his dog around the perimeter of the parking lot at about 9.30 that morning. His schnauzer was on a long leash, which allowed him to roam 20 feet away from Gallup. Gallup told police that had the body been there, the dog would have caught the scent and reacted. Based on Gallup's statement, police determined that Mark was dropped off within two hours before he was found. The investigation went nowhere. Neither the Ferndale Police nor the Oakland County Sheriff's Office had any leads or suspects. They believed that Mark's murder was random, a horrible but singular event. Ten months later, they were proven wrong with an, when another child disappeared. Twelve-year-old Jill Robinson and her two younger sisters lived with their mother, Carol, in Royal Oak, Michigan. Royal Oak, another Detroit suburb, sits just north of Ferndale, about three miles away from Stebbins' home. Like Ruth Stebbins, Carol was divorced and the girl's father, Tom, lived five miles away in Birmingham. Jill was in the sixth grade at Longfellow Elementary School, where she earned excellent grades. She loved her classes, especially English, social studies, and science. According to Carol, Jill was an avid reader and, quote, always had her nose in a book. In the early evening of Wednesday, December 22, 1976, Carol was making dinner when she noticed that Jill was upset. Carol asked Jill what was wrong, but the sixth grader refused to talk about it. Carol wanted Jill to make biscuits for dinner, and Jill refused again. Carol and Jill fought, as mothers and daughters do. Jill told Carol that she didn't want to be there anymore. Carol told her to put her coat on, go stand on the front porch, and think about whether she really wanted to leave. She told her daughter to come back in when she felt like talking about what was bothering her. At around 5.30, Jill packed a blanket a brush, and some books into her blue denim Levi's brand backpack and exited the house. When she left, she was wearing a denim jumpsuit, snow boots, an orange parka, and a blue knit hat with a yellow zigzag stripe. Ten minutes later, Carol sent Jill's sister, alone, Aileen, to bring Jill inside. Aileen returned to tell Carol that Jill was gone, and so was her bike. At six o'clock, Carol drove around the neighborhood looking for Jill. When she didn't find her, Carol presumed that their daughter was heading to her father's house in Birmingham. Carol went to church and after drove to Tom's house. Tom wasn't home and Carol was sick with worry. At 11.30, there was still no sign of Jill and Carol called the police. Royal Oak, Royal Oak Police treated Jill as a runaway and told Carol she probably was at a friend's house and would return soon. By the next day, police no longer considered Jill a runaway. They spoke to one witness, a family friend, who reported seeing Jill traveling north on Woodward Avenue toward Birmingham at approximately 7.30 p.m., about two hours after she left their mother's house. 
On Saturday, December 26, the day after Christmas, a motorist spotted Jill's body in the snow on Interstate 75 near Troy, Michigan. The location was close to the Troy police station. Jill was fully clothed, lying face up, still wearing her backpack. Jill's face was obliterated. The motorist called police immediately to report what he found. Blood and shotgun pellets told police that Jill was shot at the scene with a 12-gauge shotgun. There were no shell casings, however, to tell police what brand of gun was used. Investigators concluded that whoever killed Jill carried her from a car, placed her on the side of the highway, and shot her in the face from 6 to 10 inches away. They estimated that these events occurred between 2 and 4 a.m. When police searched Jill's backpack, they found the blanket inside, but the books and brush were gone. At autopsy, the medical examiner found no evidence of sexual assault. The autopsy report states that Jill died from the gunshot wound. But Detective Jack Kalbfleisch of the Birmingham Police worked on the investigation. He has a different theory. He believes that the killer suffocated Jill just like he did Mark Stebbins. When he dropped her body in the snow, Kalbfleisch believes the impact forced the remaining air out of Jill's lungs, causing a sound leading the killer to believe she was still alive. The shotgun blast made sure the girl was dead. According to Marnie Rich Keenan, author of The Snow Killings, a neighborhood boy found Jill's bike at approximately noon on December 27th, the day after Jill's body was found. The purple bike was behind a store on North Main Street near Euclid Avenue in Royal Oak, less than a half mile from Jill's house. To this day, no one knows if Jill rode her bike to the location or if the killer placed it there after he killed her. Investigators interviewed a motorist who reported seeing a car parked on the side of I-75 in the same area where Jill's body was dropped. At approximately 8.45 a.m. on December 26th, the motorist observed a light blue 1971 or 1972 Pontiac Le Mans or Buick Skylark. A January 10th report from the Michigan State Police states that the witness reported a Pontiac Tempest. Whatever the case, the witness recognized the make and year of the car because he previously owned one. He also recalled that the paint on the car was faded and the corner of the right tail light was broken. Excuse me, the right tail light cover was broken. The witness observed two people inside the car. He watched as the driver of the car pulled away from the snowbank and back onto the highway. As the witness left the area, they observed the car return to the same spot. The investigation into Jill's murder turned up no more leads than in the Mark Stebbins case. Less than a week after the discovery of Jill's body, another girl went missing, this time from the suburb of Berkeley, Michigan. Ten-year-old Christine Mihalik was in the fifth grade and the oldest of four siblings. Her mother, Debbie Ascroft, worked at Hartfield Bowling Alley on 12 Mile Road in Berkeley. She and Chris's father, Dan Mihalik, were divorced and Debbie was remarried to Chris's stepfather, Tom Ascroft. As the 1976-77 holiday break drew to her close, Chris looked forward to getting back to school so she could tell her friends about her Christmas. On the afternoon of January 2nd, 1977, Chris was at her Gardner Street home taking down Christmas decorations with her mom. Chris pleaded with Debbie to let her walk to the 7-Eleven by the bowling alley to purchase a teen magazine. Chris got a brand new record player for Christmas and the latest album from Donnie and Marie Osmond. She was desperate to buy the magazine, which featured the hugely popular Singing Siblings. At first, Debbie said no. Although Chris had walked the route many times, Debbie thought Chris was too young to cross busy 12-mile road on her own. Eventually, Debbie acquiesced and told Chris she could go, but she had to promise she would cross at the light. The 7-Eleven was only a few blocks from home, and Chris promised to be careful. Debbie expected Chris back home within 30 minutes or so. An hour passed and Chris was still gone. At 6.30 p.m., Chris still had not returned and Debbie called police. Police retraced Chris's movements from the time she left the house. They spoke with Kathy Carson, the cashier at the 7-Eleven, and confirmed that the young girl made it to the store where she bought the magazine and left. Carson didn't see where Chris went after she left the store. Faced with the abductions of three local children and the murder of two, Police acknowledged that they were likely dealing with a serial child sex offender and murderer. Police assembled a task force of 50 to 60 officers from various agencies in the area. Detectives from all over Oakland County, like Jack Kalfleisch, 
volunteered their time and labor to the investigation, whether they had a victim in their jurisdiction or not. Days passed with no signs of Chris. Days turned into weeks, and her family feared the worst. Nineteen days later, her parents received the dreaded news. Their little girl was dead. On January 27, 1977, postal worker Jerome Wozni noticed something lying in a ditch on the side of Bruce Lane along his route in the suburb of Franklin Village, about five miles west of Berkeley. The object was partially covered in snow and something red was sticking out. When he got closer, he realized it was a human hand and that he was looking the, at the body of a young girl, her colorful coat frozen to her torso. Wozni looked at the girl for a few moments before running back to his mail truck and reporting the grisly discovery. Police arrived at the scene where they uncovered the body of Christine Mihalik. There was no blood on or near the body, nothing to indicate she was killed at the scene. Oakland County Medical Examiner Dr. Robert Sillery performed Christine's autopsy. Sillery determined that Christine died from asphyxiation by suffocation, just like Mark Stebbins. He concluded that Chris died within hours before Wozni found her. Most sources state that, like the Robinson girl, there was no evidence to suggest Christine was sexually assaulted during her weeks of captivity. In the snow killings, Marnie Rich Keegan cites police reports stating that Dr. Sillery found no gross evidence of sexual assault, specifically no evidence of penetration into her anus or vagina. The report also states that Sillery told the lab, state lab technicians that he found sperm in Christine's vagina and rectum. Sillery couldn't explain how the sperm got there, but suggested it may have been from, quote, forceful ejaculation. Keenan claims that subsequent testing by a second pathologist and two state crime lab technicians contradicted Sillery's findings. They reviewed his slides and found zero sperm present in the samples. Keenan also reports that Sillery found that Christine's clothing, including her underwear, were, quote, neat and clean and that she redressed herself after being naked at some point. Debbie Ascroft di disagreed with Sillery's conclusion. She said that Christine's pants were tucked into her boots, which she never would have done. Also, Christine's blouse was on wrong. Debbie said that the blouse had ties that went in the back, and when she was found, the blouse was tied in front. A 2014 police memorandum exists that states that the car used to drop Christine's body left both front and rear bumper impressions in the snow. Detective Kalbfleisch located a photograph of the impressions taken in 1977. He was angered to find out that no one ever took measurements of the impressions. Kalbfleisch sent the photos to a photographer who reconstructed the scene. When Kalbfleisch received the measurements from the reconstruction, he sent them to three major car manufacturers in the area. General Motors advised Kalbfleisch that the measurements were consistent with the following cars, a 1971 or 72 Buick Skylark or a Pontiac Le Mans. According to Kalbfleisch, no one during the original investigation ever followed up on any of the vehicle leads in the first three cases. The witness report about the Pontiac Le Mans and the Joe Robinson case, as well as the images of the bumper impression at the Mihalik dump site, were filed away and forgotten. After Malik story, excuse me, after Malik's stories of the missing and murdered children inundated the news, a public campaign made presidents and teachers aware, made parents and teachers aware of the fact that a serial predator was at work in the Detroit suburbs. Almost overnight, life changed completely for the children of Oakland County. Parents no longer allowed their kids to play alone outside or go anywhere on their own. Three months later, the Oakland County child killer took his fourth and final victim. 11-year-old Tim King was a sixth grader at Adams Elementary, where he earned perfect grades. Tim loved baseball, and he was looking forward to tryouts for his school team. Tim lived with his parents, Barry and Marion King, on Yorkshire Road in the Detroit suburb of Birmingham. Tim had two siblings, his 17-year-old sister, Kathy, and two brothers, Chris, who just celebrated his 16th birthday, and Mark, age 13. On Wednesday, March 16, 1977, the day before St. Patrick's Day, Tim spent much of the unusually sunny afternoon skateboarding with three of his friends in the parking lot of Hunter Maple Pharmacy and Chatham Market, less than three blocks from his home on Yorkshire Road. The plaza was located on Woodward Avenue and Adams Road. Later that evening, Tim was home alone with his sister, Kathy. 
his older brothers were out doing their own thing. Chris was acting as a the neighborhood babysitter, and Mark was at the rehearsals for his school play. Tim's sister, Kathy, had plans to see Jerry Lewis at a conference center in Dearborn. Marion and Barry King were also going out for the night, and for the first time ever, gave Tim permission to stay home alone. Before Kathy left for the Jerry Lewis show, Tim asked her if he could borrow 30 cents to buy a candy bar at the Hunter Maple Plaza. She gave him the money, and at 745, Tim left his house on a skateboard and headed to the market. When he left, Tim was wearing green corduroy pants, a denim shirt, a bright red nylon Birmingham Hockey Association jacket, and white tennis shoes. Fifteen minutes later, Kathy left for Dearborn. Marion and Barry were already out, first meeting with one of Barry's clients, then having dinner at Peabody's, less than 500 feet from the Hunter Maple Plaza. When the Kings arrived home between 8.30 and 9 o'clock that night, Tim wasn't home. They searched for the boy for hours, knocking on every door and checking the homes of each of his friends. Late that night, Chris King was unable to sleep. Armed with a baseball bat, Chris walked to the Hunter Mega Plaza, unsure of what he would find. He reported that he observed three or four cars in the parking lot, one of which was a blue AMC Gremlin with a white hockey stripe. Chris was particularly fond of gremlins, and despite being terrified of what he would see, he peered inside the car window. According to Chris, nothing about the interior of the car looked suspicious at all. The Kings hoped beyond hope that Kathy would know where Tim was. When she referred, returned from Dearborn at approximately 2 a.m., she told them that the last time she saw Tim was when he left to buy candy at the Hunter Maple Plaza, and that was just before 8 o'clock. Knowing that at least three children had been abducted and murdered in the area, the Kings feared the worst and called police. The search for Tim King led police to the clerk at the Hunter Maple Pharmacy. The clerk, Amy Walters, advised that Timmy came into the store about 8.30 p.m. He bought his candy and he left out the back door. Additional witnesses saw Tim at the plaza as well. Two days after Tim disappeared, Edith Raubacher reported seeing a boy in a red jacket with sports emblems speaking to a man in the parking lot outside of the Chatham Market. Raubacher described the man as swarthy, possibly Mediterranean, with long dark hair and dark sideburns and dark skin. She estimated he was between 25 and 30 years old. Raubacher also reported the man was standing next to a blue AMC gremlin with a white hockey stripe on the side. This blue gremlin played a major role in the investigation of the Oakland County, Oakland County child killings. In the next episode, we will talk about how the search for the gremlin may have steered everything in the wrong direction. Based on the Rob Barker's description, police generated a composite sketch of the man seen talking to Kim, Tim King. The sketch, along with a generic photo of an AMC gremlin, was distributed on flyers throughout the area and broadcast on every news outlet. When Lenore Marzolino saw the sketch on the news, she reported that she was in the pharmacy the night filling a prescription. She, she was sitting in the back of the store and observed a man leave the pharmacy at the rear entrance. Just before he stepped out the door, the man paused to look at a group of children in the candy aisle. Marzolino was close enough to get a good look at the man and told police that she believed his nose was bigger and his sideburns longer than those in the police sketch. The police artist modified the drawing and showed it to Mrs. Raubarker, who agreed that the second portrait was more accurate. That afternoon, investigators persuaded Marion and Barry King to appear at a press conference and make a plea for Tim's release. According to Marnie Keenan, Marion also wrote a letter to her son's abductor, in which she said that Timmy's favorite meal was fried chicken and that she would have it ready for him when he got home. The Tr Detroit News published the letter on the fourth day after Tim vanished. The gremlin sighting at Hunter Maple Plaza was the first real lead police had in the Oakland County child killings. The task force did everything in their power to track down each of the 8,000 AMC gremlins registered in Michigan. On Friday, March 18th, Oakland County Prosecutor L. Brooks Patterson made a bold move. He ordered all local law enforcement to stop and search every single gremlin on the streets of Oakland in Oakland County after midnight. Patterson knew that the order was unconstitutional, but he was willing to take the fall. As, fa as far as he was concerned, he had a child to find, and he would do whatever was necessary to find him alive. Police stopped more than 2,000 vehicles in the search for Tim King. 
In the end, they were no closer to finding the missing boy than when they started. On March 22nd, six days after Tim's abduction, Daryl Wilkinson and Olaf Peterson were driving down Gill Road in Livonia. They made a U-turn on Gill near Eight Mile Road, and their headlights illuminated something red in a ditch. They approached and saw that the red object, object was a hockey jacket. They had just discovered the body of Tim King, his skateboard lying just a few feet away. Wilkinson and Peterson drove to the nearest house, where they called the Livonia police, who arrived three minutes later. Renowned forensic pathologist Werner Spitz was the medical examiner for Wayne County and performed Tim King's autopsy. Autopsy revealed that Tim, like Stebbins and Mihalik, died by suffocation within hours before being found. Their bruises on the left side of Tim's forehead, leading Spitz to conclude that Tim was struck on the head shortly after death, possibly as his body was discarded. Spitz found minor, minor scrapes around his mouth, scratches on the inside of his mouth, and a bite mark on his swollen tongue. From these injuries, Spitz concluded that Tim was smothered to death. Spitz believed that the killer used a pillow, not his hand, to suffocate Tim. Had it been done by a hand, Tim's face would show more signs of trauma from the struggle. Spitz found no semen in or on Tim's body, but dilation of his anus and abrasions inside of his anal canal indicated that he endured multiple incidents of sexual abuse, just like Mark Stebbins. Ligature marks on Tim's wrist told Spitz that Tim, like Mark, was tied up during captivity. Spitz noted that Tim's body and clothing were exceptionally clean, as were his finger and toenails. According to Detective Kaufleisch, tests showed the presence of Pfizer-Hex on the body. Pfizer-Hex, or hexachlorophene, is an antiseptic cleansing agent used primarily in the medical profession and by people who suffer from skin disorders. Many sources claim that all four bodies were cleaned with the antiseptic solution. An October 2012 article in USA Today, however, claims that only Tim's body was cleaned with the solution and that the brand was never identified. Examination of Tim's, Tim's stomach contacts contents told investigators something important about the offender or offenders responsible for the murders. He or they were watching the coverage of the search for Tim and had likely seen the King family press conference. The autopsy report showed that little Timmy King ate fried chicken within six hours before he died. Law enforcement believes that Tim King was the last victim of the Oakland County child killer. A year later, the task force cleared more than 7,000 suspects tracked 3,000 gremlins, and reviewed the files of more than 10,000 sex offenders. Claiming they had no suspects, no leads, and more importantly, no money, the task force shut down, and the search for the Oakland County child killer was effectively over. In 2005, author J. Reuben Appleman began his own investigation of the Oakland County child murders. Excuse me, Oakland County child murders. As a kid, he grew up in the Detroit suburbs when the murders happened. Appleman was deeply affected by the collective fear that per permeated his childhood. Appleman has also has a personal connection to the case. In the late 1970s, seven-year-old Appleman was approached by a strange man in a small car. The man had dark, thinning hair, dark eyes, and sideburns. He opened the door, tried to grab a Appleman by his arm, and said, get in the car. Appleman took off running, believing he was about to be another victim of the Oakland County child killer. With the help of Ting's, Tim King's sister, Kathy, Appleman collected thousands of documents from the original investigation. For a case in which law enforcement claimed they had no leads, reports contained plenty of information to the contrary. Appleman was not, only the, was not the only one investigating the cases. It was in, also in 2005, Detective Corey Williams reopened the investigation, assembling a new task force whose job it was to re-examine the case with fresh eyes. Reviewing the files, Williams came to the same conclusion as Kathy Broad and J. Reuben Appleman. He discovered reports of critical trace evidence recovered in the cases, an amount of suspects who were interviewed and cleared by a polygraph alone. These suspects include a cadre of child sex offenders, including one who reported knowing who killed the first victim. Appleman's research led him to articles about a child sex and pornography ring posing as a boys camp that ran for two summers in 1975 and 1976. After one victim reported his abuse to police, 
the camp was shut down and the owner fled the country. Appleman discovered that one of the suspects cleared in the Oakland County cases, a man from a wealthy Michigan family, had a direct connection to the pornography ring. In 1978, this man was found dead in his home with a gunshot wound to the head. When police searched the man's home, they found evidence incriminating the man in the killing of Mark Stebbins. Despite evidence to the contrary, the medical examiner ruled that the gunshot was self-inflicted. Next time, we'll talk about the suspects in the Oakland County child killings. We'll also cover evidence in the cases on our decades after the investigation officially closed. For now, uh, I know we all want to hear what Doc has to say about the cases, so let's get to the analysis. Lots of behavioral stuff to analyze in this. As always, if we don't have the case files, there's things that we can't determine for sure. There's probably whole back information, and there's things that are up for interpretation. Look, this is a white male or males. I have a strong intuition that this could be more than one offender. Um, it's difficult to redress a, a kid. Uh, presumably, they're dead if you're the one redressing them. And that can be very difficult, um, transporting them in the car, getting them out. Uh, and also, this is the type of crime uh, that, I, that I think would lend itself to two offenders. There's long-term um, confinement of the child as well. Uh, I think the... Really, I can just talk about the what I would say is as one of the most prominent offenders, uh, if it was to, of course, it could always be one. Um, I would say between 25 and 35. I will caution that I was unwittingly exposed to some information that might have biased that. I think I saw a suspect. I think I would have put it between 25 and 35 anyways. That's the best range. But um, the take the age with a grain of salt. Um, this is a non-psychopath. Uh, why do I think that? Well, Look at the, the manner in which they were killed. Uh, a pillow is used to put over their face. So if you think of what that is, in fact, I could probably use this little booklet here, right? It blocks it out. So it's the opposite of, of sadism in a way, where sadism is you want to see the person's face. You want to uh, uh, witness the pain and be stimulated by that. This is The killing is kind of like an, a means to an end. It's utilitarian. It's not the thing that they want. What, what they do want is, is to sexually abuse the children. And so they're actually creating kind of a psychological barrier there um, in, in smothering the children because they don't have to look at their faces. And as, as far as killings go, like smothering with the pillow, it's not exactly hands-on. Um, there's, you know, there's the softness between that. There's, like I said, there's like a barrier. It's not bloody. Um, it's not too brutal. And so that would lead me to think it's a non-psychopathic offender. As always, psychopathy, that's a clinical diagnosis. Um, it, it's not to say this person is evil. Of course they are. And they're a pedophile. Um, what you see with psychopaths is psychopaths are like equal opportunity offenders. They might um, they might uh, kill someone who's this age, rob someone who's that age, uh, switch genders. And so, yeah, they might sexually abuse and kill a kid because the, the kid was available. But it doesn't mean that they're um, preferentially attracted or even really strongly attract, um, attracted to children. So um, this guy or guys, these are really pure pedophiles in, in the strictest sense. I have a feeling that this, this main offender is, is single um, and he would almost certainly be a homeowner. At least one of the, the two of them, if there are two, would have to own a home. I imagine the child, that's where the child is kept. Um, so we've got different types of, of behavior done with the children. We have the sexual abuse of boys, which is repeated sodomy and restraints. Now, you might be thinking the restraints serve uh, an MO or practical function, and they may have, but why don't the girls also have those restraints? Okay, if they're adults, you might say, well, men are physically larger, more powerful, so you have to make sure they're restrained, uh, whereas women... I don't know, maybe you can take more of a chance with, but at that age, there's no real meaningful difference between boys and girls. And so when you put this next to the fact that the boys were uh, repeatedly sodomized, I think that these were less restraints and more like bondage. So these were props. These were part of a sexual fantasy. Uh, the girls don't seem to have been sexually abused, but then again, um, oral sex is always a possibility, um, right? Um, there's if, if it's not done forcefully, there would be less uh, chance to, there would be less signs of that medically. Uh, and if there was no semen ingested, uh, you know, that would explain why that wasn't in the stomach. It could be also, though, if if we're going with the idea that this could be a child pornography ring or 
you know, child pornographers who are, are making this content, these guys aren't themselves attracted to the girls. And so they may be taking nude photographs of them and, uh, and, and not actually sexually abusing them. Both are possible. Uh, but I, I would say whoever is doing this is primarily sexually attracted to males. Um, Jill Robinson has the shotgun blast. Okay, that, that's a lot different. We're saying about with the pillows and the smothering and then someone shot in the head with a shotgun that's very messy. I have some questions I'd like to ask the detectives about that. Uh, it's, it's clear that something happened. It, it was a reactive um, maneuver. They didn't intend to kill her with the shotgun, but uh, perhaps the detective was right where she let out some sound and he thought that she wasn't dead, so uh, shot her to make sure, or maybe the child tried to escape. And you can tell uh, what, how that happened by looking at what was at the scene where the body was dumped. So if all the books shot from the shotgun is there, if all the pieces of the child's head are there, um, you should be able to tell that. But more importantly, and I wish Cloyd was here to, to confirm exactly how, but I'm pretty sure that you can just tell from an autopsy whether or not a child was alive um, when they were shot with, this, uh, with the shotgun. So that would help too. Um, point is, uh, the shotgun was was a reaction. Um, something went wrong, and and so they responded with a shotgun. Um, it wasn't uh, it wasn't anything that the child. Um, it wasn't anything about the child in particular. I noticed there's a lot of activity on Sundays and and Wednesdays. Generally, those might be important church services on Sundays and Wednesdays. Uh, something that stands out to me. Um, so also the children are smothered. We've talked about the smothering but and redressed. Well, why redress them, right? If you look at um, Bianchi and Bono or um, the toolbox murderers, there's so many serial killers, they don't bother to re redress their victims. And that's because they're psychopathic sadists, right? They use them, they have their fun, and then they roll their naked bodies out of a truck or they dump them on a hillside or something like that. That Well, why not do that too if, it, if it's just about um, purely about sadistic sexual gratification? I think that the redressing is a way of undoing it, which I don't know if it shows guilt. It could show guilt on part of the offenders, but not, certainly not meaningful guilt. But there's an idea of, of being proper about it, almost like manners, like giving the children back. Um, the, the Stebbins was found with uh, his hands crossed on his chest. Now, I've read in other um, studies of this case that it was posed almost like sleeping, um, like uh, might, somebody might be found in a coffin. And that would uh, go more to this as well. But I, I'd like to see the crime scene photo because we know sometimes people exaggerate or the, they'll get a piece of information and they'll flower it up, journalists or something. And uh, when in reality, his hands just happen to be crossed in a completely different manner um, across them. However, uh, if that is the case, uh, it's hard to imagine, actually, that he's placed down and his hands cross his chest uh, in any kind of symbolic manner accidentally. So I do wonder about that. The chicken being fed to the child, that's another example too. So um, like I said, it's not, it's not guilt. And I don't know if it's shame, but there's a, there's a level of care, you know, a very perverse care performed. And we can discuss what that means later. Obviously, the killer has their own vehicle. I think it's also pretty obvious that they're employed. They got to pay for that vehicle. They got to pay for the place uh, where the children are held. Um, also, some activity on Sundays. Uh, two might show, uh, lend greater credence to the idea that they have a job. I think uh, the killer is going to be neat in appearance, tidy, um, and quiet and unassuming generally. But I've gone on a little too long. I'm going to bring up uh, Alex and Morph to discuss. <sighs> this is a great case. Yeah. Um when I, when I, when this was one that came to us from one of our, our viewers, I think. And when I looked into it, I'm like, oh yeah, this is, this is perfect. This has got all the behavioral stuff. Um, so even when we don't have all the reports and I found quite a few, but even without all of those, there's enough out there that I knew you could give a really rich. And it's uh, not the obvious, on this one. right? No. There's, um, no. I think I said uh, like maybe 10 episodes back, it's like, you know, you guys, I think you guys are going to think I'm a, a fraud because I'm always saying psychopathic sadist or, but that, that string of cases was all that. Mm -hmm, you know, right. What we've been doing lately is it, are, are more challenging cases or, or uh, things you don't see as often. And so some of this stuff like the redressing and, and potential posing, um, it, it could fall into what we call undoing, which is like a way to kind of mitigate the murder mm -hmm. through symbolic mm -hmm. acts. 
Um, certainly, like I said, with the pillow, there's there's not wanting to see the face. There's there's like a certain psychological barrier there. So I don't think they're happy or, you know, the, the main person who's involved in this, I don't think they're happy with certain aspects of what they're doing. They just see right. it as necessary. Obviously, they take great delight in, in sexually abusing um, at least the boys. Right. So I'm, I, I found it interesting, you know, this isn't necessarily somebody that is targeting kids to torture and kill. The killing seems like it's the means to an end of not being identified, not being caught. Yeah. And maybe if they, they thought they could, you know, let them go they might have other than you know it wasn't just to kill them yeah probably they're you know they're keeping them for a long time and they probably don't want to keep their faces covered that whole time or they just rationally deduce we're, we're not going to be able to do that um or, or you know i'm using the plural which is kind of giving us away it could be the the singular but when you've got a kid that much time and uh yeah it's just not realistic that you're going to be able to hide the identity and if you don't hide your identity then um you have to kill the child, mm -hmm. which might mean that they were previously convicted for a child sexual abuse, mm. where you know, the child did see their face. Not necessarily, but it's a possible um, previous right. indicator. Right. What I think about is interesting about this case is there's everything could point to a clue. You know, you you, you talk about they're being kept for several days. That's not going to happen if, if it's a family man with his wife and kids at home. They're not going to keep a kid tied up in the basement, most likely. So you every need, once in it, a while it happens, but yeah, Israel yeah. Keys immediately yeah. comes to mind. But it, it could, but yeah, most of the time, no. This family, did he? Did he live? With she was family? out in the shed. He lived yeah, with the girl. He was in the house with his family. She was dead though. Yeah. So there's a there's a risk mitigation, right? Yeah, but the, she she was alive for some, for some time when time. he drank wine. Yeah. yeah, drank wine with her and did all those things. Yeah, Keys is also a psychopath, right? So he doesn't right. have the same type of uh, anxiety, right. that type of thing. But it is exactly. rare. So so most of the time, it's not going to be a, a married guy with a family at home. So I think that yeah that brings you to a, a certain subset of of who it could be. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, I'm trying to think without giving too much away for next episode. Mm, yeah. I've got some faces rattling around in my mind. I don't want to say too much yeah. to spoil it, but um, it's going to be sort of the usual suspects, when, I think, when it comes to talking about some people and, and seeing how they fit into these little uh, puzzles of, you know, are they mm -hmm. previous pedophiles? Do they have a record? Are they known to police? And... Um, you know, we talked about the, the island a little bit. Um, the, the timing with that is is pretty interesting. So I'm, I'm just mm -hmm. I'm trying not to say too much because I don't want to spoil anything. Right. For well, when I, I gave my little um, profile there, did anyone, did any lights go on? Yeah. Well, yeah. 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 Plenty. Ding, 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 ding. And I, I think we can, I mean, without spoiling it too much, I think we could say there's a circle, a cluster of pedophiles that yeah. could very well be involved in in this case um it you know it, it is interesting and, and another thing that could be a little clue too is you mentioned okay the boys are sodomized the girls are not they're obviously abducting those girls for some purpose and even if it's just to take photographs of them mm -hmm. pornography well that still is a clue about that offender you know yeah. so you know <laughs> do they target the boys and then produce pornography so that could still help whittle down the list of who that could be sure. in relation to the other uh, clues as well. I think if you're looking at a vast child sex ring, those girls are going to be sexually abused. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you, you don't have to add too many perverts before you get to someone that will have sex with a, um, a little girl too, right? Um, so probably if, if it's a ring and, that's, uh, and the girls are being um, acquired for a different taste, it's probably a pornography ring. Yeah. Could it be, and, and let me ask you this, I, maybe this is getting too far into the weeds, but could these guys have just saw uh, a chance and, and picked them up? They happened to be girls and they were going to molest them, but they couldn't, you know, get aroused and didn't complete the the molestation of them? No, because they'd penetrate them with foreign objects. Right. And also there's the fact, which is going to lead me to the question I have for you, Lee, the fact that Mihalik was held for 19 days. Mm -hmm. um, that's a 
big waste of time if you're not aroused by the child, you know, that you have. So my question is, why 19 days with Christine? The other what? short time periods seem like a quick, we get this done, we turn it around, we move on. But why hold Christine for 19 days? She could have been sexually abused, right? She could have been forced to perform oral sex. And then, um, mm -hmm. you know, there was no ejaculation, which is hard to believe after 19 days. Or, you know, the semen was spit out or something, right? Mm -hmm. It's possible. Um, but why would they want to hold on to her for that long? As opposed they were to doing the something kid. right, they're doing something with with her. Um, if if you weren't getting uh, the the satisfaction or the results that you wanted, you would quickly mm -hmm. terminate the situation. That's what I would think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we we don't want to um, assume too much. Um, what do you think about the idea of the of the boys being used, particularly in a bondage fantasy? I think that's very reasonable. But I also think you mentioned um, if it was a single offender, um, not being able or being more difficult to contain a child if that person had to go to work and leave the house. To me, that would be another reason to bind your victim. But why not? But then again, the why not the girls? Exactly. Point, exactly. Right? So, yeah. yeah, every choice they make, you have to go, well, why that and not that? Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know. Uh, and, and we know the boys were sodomized. So, uh, uh, you know, anal sex with a, a young boy who is bound, that that's, would be, I think, a fairly common uh, specific type of pedophilic mm -hmm. fantasy. Right. Right. Could, um, could, I, I did want to ask you one thing. You know, we're, we're talking one person versus two. Um, what do you think about the possibility that one of the persons, one of the, if it's a two person team, let's say, one of them's more. Uh, sorry for what they've done and wants to, you know, treat that child as human, humanely as they can in the end. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. is, is there a possibility that one of them, we've seen that before with, you know, various sets of killers where one's real hardcore doesn't give a shit and mm -hmm. the other one's remorseful or almost yeah. apologetic for what they've done. You think something like that could be going on? Well, well Mork, you actually just uh, put a little bulb on in my head. It's possible that one of them's a woman. Mm. I mean, that accounts for we know that happens right we can go through um various uh serial killer couples so you have this woman who's like uh she could be a domestic abuse victim or just you know under the control of of a dominant male and uh and in some ways helping in the abductions confinement and uh and disposal of these children in fact yeah I wish what I about an earlier okay what about Allure somebody closer to the child's ages hmm. that would relate to the victims, had been groomed, had been abused himself. Um, would that person maybe be the one to feel more remorse, like an so to speak? Elmer Wayne Henley type from Dean Coral, more remorseful, yeah, yeah, oh, Ish. yeah, that's why um, I think actually. Yeah, I think there's, you know, the more we talk about it, I think there's two people involved in this, maybe even three. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's lucky like And it more, isn't. actually, to your point, the very first homicide I ever worked was a duo. And there was one extremely dominant, as there always is, one very dominant, aggressive partner. And his male partner um, went back to, it was a triple homicide, and went back to the scene after they had shot all of them in the head and raped them all. Uh, the partner, John Suspauer, went back that night or the next day and covered the bodies. There you go. And mm -hmm. wrapped them up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so you and see, he was the rapist. He was behavior. not the murderer. He was the rapist. Right. You see mixed uh, behavior at a crime scene. Like, mm -hmm. you know, you think, well, why would you have any care for a child that you've like repeatedly sodomized, right? You And, and killed. I mean, that's a brutal act. And then the the idea is, well, that's one party and the person who mm -hmm. um, feeds them chicken and maybe poses the, with the, the hands on the chest, potentially, that's another party. Yeah. yeah. And we're, we're going to talk about a cesspool, or I assume we're going to talk about a cesspool of different degenerate child mm -hmm. molesters 
but I, I think most of them are men. So you bring up an interesting point. If there is a woman involved, let's say a partner of one of these guys um, that's forced to participate or willingly participates, mm -hmm. it would be interesting to see if any cases could be found where there was a woman involved in some manner. And, and maybe that could be a clue that hasn't been really looked into before in this case. In Michigan at this time, was that, you mean cases from that era? Yeah. Cases that could possibly, you know, you know, stand out because a woman had some kind of role as in helping cover it up, helping dispose of a body, helping dispose of a victim. Um, you know, maybe somebody that escaped talked about a woman being involved in some manner. So maybe that would be a worthwhile avenue just to see if there's anything that stands out along those lines. This is a great comparison case. Um, Mark Dutroux in mm. Belgium in the 90s, um, he worked with an accomplice and his wife, um, used the children in, in child pornography as well and kept them for long periods of time. In fact, I believe some of the children died of something like starvation or something because um, he was confined in prison. And couldn't they were they were locked inside his house wow yeah yeah mm -hmm. um so that's a great comparison case study that that's if i was speaking to like a detective who's working on this case i'd say hey take a look at this you don't yeah. you know yeah um so yeah the more we talk about it the more i'm actually fairly quickly moving towards that it's frightening if this is more than one person involved in this that they could keep this a secret you know, eventually somebody seems to spill the beans, but then again, this subset of society, they're the scummiest of the scumbags that hide right. in the sewers together no. out of the light. So maybe they would keep a secret like this because they keep so many awful secrets amongst themselves anyway. You know, maybe this does scream that this is some pair of pedophiles or yeah. um somebody with with experience and you know it'll be interesting when we get to the next episode we start talking about some of these suspects in detail because there were some that sort of fit the the two-man team mm -hmm. scenario maybe better than other ones and another reference case i would encourage people to look at is um in the uk hissing sid cook leslie bailey lenny smith Robert Oliver. It was this giant ring of pedophilic serial killers, um, mainly targeting boys, and uh, yeah, absolutely horrific. Like huh. difficult to to confront. Um, so that's that's another reference case. I might revise the profile next up, so we'll see. Uh, and what and Alex, can you touch yeah. on what they? possibly were with or at least one of them was cleaned with that solution how rare is that and and what oh, okay out of that? so okay i there's been different incarnations of fiza hex or chlorhexapine um it's a for i'm trying to remember it's a slightly formaldehyde based cleaning agent Back at some point, it was banned in the United States because it was so dangerous. And then it changed formulas over the over the years. I use chlorhexadrine, which is a variation on it. Um, but it was fairly common. I know my, my partner, he used it uh, when he was young on skin disorders. It's still available today. Um, it's primarily by prescription so that that's something that if you had it at your home you either are going to be in the medical profession which don't we say that about all cases or you're going to have a prescription for it so i wonder if they checked pharmacies to see if anybody had a prescription for that stuff how common it was and then i also wonder what well, is the purpose of using it as the killer are you trying to clean evidence because we know they didn't know about dna in 19, in 19 but there's the other things you know yeah. if, blood type fibers blood type yeah. yeah uh fingerprints and also lee and i were discussing this before if they are filming these children or taking photos keeping the children clean and attractive is going to be necessary to doing the business um you don't want to put out dirty product so that could have been another reason to use it. But then again, I have to 
bring up that several sources, some say that we don't know what brand was used. Some sources say that the solution was used on all four bodies. Um, so. Wouldn't it be interesting if it, it was taken by uh, the hypothetical female from a hypothetical hospital where she worked as a nurse hypothetically? It could be. Yeah. Uh, should we get Doug up? Yes. I want yeah. to know what he's got to say. Douglas McGregor's here. He's going to take us through the geographical profiling aspects. Um, Doug, you're hey there, muted. Doug. I've unmuted you. There we go. How's everybody okay. doing? Hey, you doing? Great. Pretty good. good. Um, All right. Let me get your slides up here. Yeah, we can do those first. So I got notes here, whatever, whatever you like. Okay. Okay. Uh, so this is just, so I use the information that Alex gave me as well as uh, some other maps that I found online to get the, the sites of, uh, rough this the rough sites of where the kids were taken abducted from and then where their bodies were found so i'm pretty sure these are these are fairly accurate from what i've taken um so this first map that's all it is the, the four abduction sites and the four sites where the bodies were found and before we go into the next maps i just wanted to ask you guys or anybody that's watching in the chat what what do you see here? Well, they're all abducted along that uh, highway there. Is it the Highway 1? Yes, Woodward Which Avenue. One? Yes, Woodward Avenue, yeah. Right, yeah. right. So they're not targeting children. Uh, sorry, yeah, they're not targeting specific children. They're they're trolling along this, uh, along this, yes. yeah. It yep. also looks like they're dropped off in different jurisdictions, assuming those are different area towns or um, county lines, maybe? Mahalik. The county was lines it? aren't on there, but there were okay. a few that crossed over county lines. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Specifically, and the theory the was that okay. once the pressure was on, they started dumping in other jurisdictions to confuse the investigation. Yeah, possibly, and and that could very well be. Um, I saw that as well. I mean, I personally wouldn't. I mean, I guess it's easier in around that area because uh, counties are divided by streets. But I mean, obviously, in some places they aren't. So maybe they did know where the county lines were. So that could be a possibility. Right. Yeah. Sure. Anything else? No. It's, it's definitely interesting that that straight line of where they're picking up victims seems very uh, central. Now, That's down true. on my map that that we use that I sent you, Doug, you know, one of my big P's for pedophile was down in a place called Cass Corridor. Okay. Now, is that also on Woodward Avenue? uh is that the name of the the borough borough i don't know um i just know that that was where uh, this, right. not, not necessarily the ring but this you know the the pedophiles that's where they hung out was in cast corridor yes it's right at the bottom of uh woodward avenue and it's okay, right in down, downtown detroit mm -hmm. yeah so uh it is at the, on the same street Doug, so they, can, oh sorry can I no. ask you, Doug, how far a stretch is this area along this, this highway where they were abducted? I think it's, I'll give you the exact distance here, from King to Stebbins, it was just over seven miles. And and the majority of them looked like they were, what, three miles? Yeah. Three, they three were, of the four? Yeah. They were roughly, like the three, the three up top, three uh, that were grouped close together they were all within three miles of one another and then stebbins was uh four miles south of that huh. so it was okay. a, I can't, can't wait to see what you have to say about that mm -hmm. seeing seeing that targeter well doug what i'm noticing is three mm -hmm. of the bodies are are dumped to what i presume is the west there of the of the main drag where they were taken mm -hmm. and they're kind of along roads that they're kind of a, a yeah, they're along roads that once again come down north south. At least two of them are. Um, exactly. And then another another one is on a road that come that is on the east of that main drag, but it's it's off another road. So it seems to me that they're being picked up and dumped off north south roads. And if you think that they're being dumped away from where the killer lives, then I think that you probably. Um, 
and this is just preliminary, I'm just thinking on my feet, you probably, uh, they're probably coming from the north and, and coming down. Yeah, quite possibly. And, and you know, that's a pretty good uh, assumption uh, based on how it's laid out there. And, uh, and you know, you have that cluster up. You have the cluster towards the north, obviously the three of them. Yeah. Um, however, Stebbins is the first one that we know of in the series. But, uh, but it's probably a pretty good bet that he, the, the people could possibly reside towards the north of that cluster, yes. It could be south, too. It just seems mm-hmm. to that those two roads, um, they widen as it goes south, whereas they converge in the north. It looks like they're getting towards a, a city up there, or at least a town. What is that city or town? Uh, that'll be, uh, that's Pontiac. Okay. Yeah. So what do you think about Pontiac, Doug? Uh, I, I didn't really get that far north in my analysis. I don't think they are from Pontiac, and I'll kind of get into the reasons okay. why. Um, but, it, but I mean, it's, it's quite possible. I just, the reason I don't think they're from the, they're coming from that far North is because why travel back down South to dispose of the bodies. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, and that's one thing I'll get into is like a lot of these cases, I find that offenders don't put effort in at both ends. They either put mm-hmm. effort into the abduction part or they put effort into the disposal part. They don't put effort into both, right? And so here we're seeing there's very little effort into actually abducting the children. It's very localized. It's on one street. It's not an area. It's more or less a place. They're picking up in this one area, like you said, they're trolling, but then they're putting effort into disposing. And I mean, we can name lots of cases like, you know, Bruce MacArthur, right? Silver Fox Mm -hmm. put effort into actually going and getting his victims, but then he just buried them in his garden, right? very little effort to dispose. I mean, it's obviously there's some could be like some control aspect there too, but yeah, I very, yeah, I very I rarely right. see. Yeah, yeah. But I very rarely see effort put in at both ends when it comes to abducting and disposing of victims. Right. So you're thinking that they're probably closer to where the abductions are taking place. And then, yeah, I generally think that you're going to hunt closer to home and then you're going to drop the body farther away. Yes. And I, I, you can see right with your own eyes, and, and for the people that are going to be listening to the audio version, they might want to look on the YouTube channel to see what I'm talking about. But the pickup spots are directly in the middle of the drop-off spots. So you have a almost like mm-hmm. a bullseye. Mm-hmm. It's, it's very mm-hmm. central, this area where the pickups and the drop-offs are. Mm-hmm. So, Doug, where do you think he or they travel after they pick up the kit? Do you think it's in this? You're going to call it a zone of something, I'm sure. But um, yeah, in and then, go ahead. This area or outside of the areas, like Lee suggested, north or south. Oh no, definitely inside this area. Inside, based on the information that I have at hand, mm-hmm. I would say inside this area, and then the disposing of the bodies outside of the area. Um, but they're just they're picking them up. They're taking them to, you know, a private residence someplace they obviously mm-hmm. have privacy and some place that is uh, has very little surveillance human surveillance right um from neighbors and such because they're abducting these children in the middle of the day mm-hmm. right so they have to have a mm-hmm. place that they can walk a kid in or carry a kid in mm-hmm. somehow get a kid in from a car to a house without being noticed by neighbors especially right. if they are not parents themselves and don't normally have kids with them yeah yeah, yeah, exactly. exactly. Garage, right? Yeah. And mm-hmm. I mean, obviously, we didn't have surveillance cameras, doorbell cameras back then. Um, it wasn't as built up back then. Uh, but like, you know, something else to point out about where they were operating. So if you zoom out on Google Earth and look at that whole Detroit area, coming out of Detroit, there's basically four commercial lines, right? Three that head. Uh, north and like a commercial line is in like a strip and you can see it on google earth it's very apparent just a strip of housing and commercial buildings and those all Mm -hmm. follow rail lines right and then there's one that goes west Mm -hmm. so this is operating off one of those rail lines going north uh that's heading north uh northwest um you know and generally speaking people people live around rail lines water or borders one of those three really right Mm -hmm. which is you know where all your residential commercial activity is while your money is is where all the votes count right so Mm -hmm. um 
so this is along one of those lines and i wouldn't be surprised if if they did expand or if these crimes did continue to take place that they would happen along one of the other rail lines possibly especially if it was some kind of network they may have networks going Mm -hmm. in other towns they'd probably follow those lines as well but uh i guess i guess that would i would have to map out the the other potential cases in this uh so yeah. some, some of the websites, they had a whole bunch of other cases that were oh, yeah. being part of this, right? But I didn't map any of those out. Um, Neither did I. And Not yet. You know, if it is a sex trafficking or pornography ring, it's it's very, I mean, the kids could be anywhere, any, anywhere from infants to 18 years old, right? It's not based on the people, like Lee said a moment ago, it's not based on the people abducting them. It's based on the clientele, what they right. want, right? Which right. is... Yeah, this. I mean, if it, if it is that, why were the two boys? Was there foreign object insertion? Maybe that's what the clientele wanted, right? Maybe that's mm-hmm. what was selling. Why was the girl held nineteen days? Maximize profit, right? So, mm-hmm. I guess it would depend on yeah. what scenario you're looking at here. But I would agree that it does seem, from everything I've looked at, that it's more than one person operating, yeah. and quite possibly a a pornography ring for sure. Yeah, I'm thinking we had a, a case here in the UK, the Canic Chase murders, Raymond Leslie Morris. And he was like a, a sadistic uh, pedophile who uh, had uh, female victims. And he would pick them up kind of along. It was Canic Chase is like this small village, right? He just picked them up for, kind of locally. And his wife was involved in it. You know, I, I didn't think about the female thing until Morph said. And now it's like, it's hard for me to get away from it. Mm-hmm. Doug, I know you've talked in the past. You, you, we talk about people offending where they're comfortable because they either live there, maybe work there. And I'm looking at the cluster of three and then Stebbins by himself. I'm wondering if one of them he could have encountered while at work, the other three at home or vice versa. What do you think about that possibility that, you know, he he's, lives in one of those three spots where the three happen or... He, he lives where Stebbins is or vice versa. He works in one of those locations. What do you think about that possibility? Yeah, it's, it's definitely possible. I mean, they're fairly close together. Like I said, they're only seven miles apart. Um, I think he just knew the whole, that whole stretch of Woodward Avenue between Ferndale and Birmingham. I think he was familiar with that yeah. whole stretch, probably just, you know, shopping, working, living he, that whole stretch. And he probably, I say he could be they, he, she, whatever it is, Mm. but they probably, you know, trolled up and down this line uh, and were, and and it seems like they had a preferential victim type based on these four, you know, 10 to 12 girls and boys. And it it was their selection was likely, in my opinion, probably based off of uh, availability, vulnerability, and desirability. Mm -hmm. Right. And, these, these kids were right. alone, so they're available. They were vulnerable, obviously, they're children, and mm. they were desirable based off the offender or the offender's clientele. Um, and, you know, the, the MO could be anything, right? I, like, they could have lured the kids, they could have just hauled them into the car by force, whatever's. Or fast. some combination of the two. Yeah, exactly. Right. You lure them close. I think of the abduction of Kristen French by Bernardo and Homoka, right, Doug? Um, they're just they're go, okay. We're going to drive through St. Catharines, and we're going to look for we're going to look for a girl in this age range. Oh, there's one. Get her over. We need directions. You know, by the time she realizes that the map she's looking at is nothing to do with the area, they put a knife to her and get her in the car. They do that in broad daylight. Yeah, yeah exactly. You know, and we, you talk about the age of these victims, ten to twelve. So I'm, I'm thinking, if they're older, there's a greater chance they're going to fight. Or, or flight fight or flights you know if they're younger they're probably not going to be out as frequently by themselves so i think mm. that 10 to 12 age is you're going to find more people more kids allowed to be out on their own but not yeah. like old enough to, to really fight off or you know somebody but there's also the issue of pubescence and 10 to 12, I'm pretty sure if the girls were prepubescent. So those kind of things in terms of a preference, I, I would be looking at at that more 
considering the age group? Uh, it's just when uh, it comes to the reaction of children, by the way, some very young children can be difficult to manage because they don't, <laughs> they just react. It's just like w bad man, things going out of control. They start squealing or whatever. Um, but the older you get, the more used to you get to accepting authority from strangers and you can see like the possible, possible repercussions of rebellion. And so uh, some children um, who are older are actually easier to control. Yeah, but my point is thinking from a parent standpoint. Okay. I'm not letting my kids out at six or seven to be out alone. So maybe this person would have ideally liked the younger victim, but they're not going to mm. find them walking alone as much as they would a 10 to 12 year old that's allowed to walk mm. down to the quarter store or whatever. Different times, though, right? I yeah, mean, way uh, different times. Even in the late 80s, you know, when I was like six, seven, I was going around at that time of night on a bike. Mm. Yeah. yeah, we absolutely were. Allowed, I mean, yeah, as long as our parents knew where we were at, as long as we were within supposed shouting distance, yeah, we were on our own. Yeah, I guess it varies in the neighborhood. I, like, I was allowed to go places with friends, but I wasn't really allowed to go alone. And then, you know, I lived in <laughs> Buffalo for a while, which was a pretty big city, very crowded, lots of neighbors. You couldn't really go anywhere without being out, you know, and be out of sight. But I've also lived in areas where there's, the nearest house is a quarter mile down the road. Um, so I guess it all comes into play there too, as, as to whether the kid's going to be out on their own. It's also a dynamic situation too, more if like, I remember times where, you know, I was out with friends and suddenly something happened and you find yourself on your own, even if it's kind of briefly, sure. right? Yeah. Um, you, you go up to the convenience store on bikes with your friend to get some gum and like trading cards. And then uh, their dad comes along in the car and is like, hey, you forgot about hockey practice. And then I, you know, now you have to go home alone on the bike. You know, mm -hmm. there's it's so. Um, but, yeah, I, mean, I remember even being younger than that in the 70s growing up. And there was never a time. I mean, if it was l later at night, yeah, you'd get driven. But there was never a time when our parent, when my parents, anybody's parents walked their kids anywhere. If you needed to go to the store, you better be back in 15 minutes. Um, mm. So, yeah, this didn't surprise me at all because the times were very different. I mean, it seems like um, in, uh, was it in Christine's case, mom went, to, no, it was Jill Robinson. Uh, mom thought she was at her dad's, that she'd ridden her bike all the way to Birmingham. And so she went to church. She wasn't worried about it until she got home and, you know, it was late, you know, 11 mm. o'clock. Because we did that, we just were on our own. Yeah, you know, we by didn't the have time that I kind was, of supervision. I was, I was I was allowed to ride my bike all over my town. Oh yeah, yeah. absolutely. You see in that cluster there too. I wonder if there are other cases, especially before these murders, of somebody that got away, of somebody that got picked up for trying something. If they look back along the section for for earlier offenses by people, you know, maybe that. They did a short prison stint and then came back to the same area and started killing the kids. Um, because you would I'm think, sure were, go ahead, you would think after the the murders, anybody that got picked up for that kind of crime along this area would have been under the microscope. But I wonder if they went back to beforehand and looked at predators that were now in this area. Okay, thousands and th I think it was over 10,000 uh pedophiles. That's they watched, they watched hundreds of hours of child pornography videos they right. looked at photos they went deep into it to try to find these and hmm. you know it's not that they didn't you know not to give too much away but there were plenty of people that they interviewed that gave them leads to look into and they were literally after people were polygraphed if they quote unquote passed the polygraph the file for that person was marked cleared and it was filed away so mm -hmm. that the detectives would not waste their time on leads. Jeez. That's frightening. So it's, yeah. as in most cases, they almost certainly spoke with the person who did it. Yes. Yeah. I absolutely believe they did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Doug, uh, do we have some other slides here that are worth looking at? Yeah, of course. Before we uh, move on, though, I just wanted to mention, as soon as I saw the dispersal here, 
the other thing I noticed, and this goes back to you ask you asking, you know, where did he likely these offenders likely live? Is that just by looking at this, you can see that you know they're comfortable, they blend in on that Woodward Avenue stretch where the where the children were abducted, but they are uncomfortable and they have less knowledge of the area where the bodies were uh, discarded. And that goes back to Lee, what you said in that you noticed that they were all along major arteries, right? So like in all the communities we live in, we have our mental map. We can close our eyes, we can visualize, we can drive around inside our head in our community. But outside of that, we all know the major arteries. We know the major streets, the highways that go through our cities, but nothing in between, right? Yeah. So this offender, these offenders, when they're dumping these bodies, they know the major arteries, so it's quick. Uh, it gets them out of the, their area fast, and then, but they don't know anything in between. So that's where they're dumping these bodies. Somewhere quick they can get to fast and somewhere that they're, they're familiar with, right? But outside of that, you can just, it just shows that they just, they're unaware of those areas because the side of a highway, it would have been much better to go off into some bushy area, some neighborhood, mm -hmm. right? So maybe the quick, the quick drop and jump back on the highway and get back home. Exactly. There's almost a feeling that they kind of want them to be found. Like if you're going to say, you know, that kid was posed like that. It's almost like giving it back, right? Yeah, I saw conflicting statements yeah. on whether they were actually posed or not. Um, like uh, like some of the, one of the victims, they said that she was just, was it Robinson that was laid down in the snow? But I mean, if you're going to carry a child from a car and put them down, I don't know. So I saw yeah, conflicting I statements on whether there was actual posing or not. But it, it does say something still psychologically, like, yeah, if you if you take the kid out of the car and place them down versus just rolling them out, right? Why not just roll out into the middle of the road or into the ditch, right? I mean, well, yeah, and that's, I mean, Robinson, that's pretty much what happened to her, yeah, right? Exactly. Rolled off the side of the highway. And, and there's, there's mm -hmm. bodies of water right up there you can see. Why not anchor them down and throw them in a lake or something if you're, if you just want to hopefully sink them and not have them be found? which just no. screams stranger homicide right i mean it's mm -hmm. it, it's it's a it's partly due to the time you know they weren't really thinking of forensic countermeasures the only forensic countermeasure they were thinking of was get the body away from where they live right but mm -hmm. they weren't really thinking of dna and water mm -hmm. and cleaning that and right. all that kind of stuff so mm -hmm. it was basically just their main forensic countermeasure was distance so and distance so back then wasn't as big as it is now so you just said something to me that is key. Get the body away from where they live. So yeah. when I see where they're picking these victims up and then they get the bodies to these other areas, that makes me think, and, and I'm, I can't wait to see what you have to say, if you had a guess where this person lived or, or worked, would you say they were right in this cluster someplace? Very close to it? Yeah, I'd say they were right in it. I, I, I actually identified one spot that I think they likely resided in another map. But you'll see that. to bring that up. Well, we can just go through them one at a time, I guess. Mm -hmm. So this is just quickly. They're all, generally speaking, when I'm when I've been on on this show before, on your show before, you know, you'll see like a polygon shape, which is mm -hmm. a convex <laughs> hull. Um, but because they're all in a straight line on one street, they're not really being abducted from an area. They're being abducted from a place, from a street. and that place being one street. And they could have all been on that street because they were all in communes. Mm -hmm. Mm. Yep. back and forth between places right so they could have all been on that street when they were abducted um which is probably the more likely scenario and uh and so in that sense you either just look at the road itself or here i use the circle theory and drew a circle but for the most part from everything i've seen it's just the one street that they're trolling okay that tempts me to want to do a, what I did with the Zodiac case and map out every person that lived in those houses there because mm -hmm. I can map out on a map and go through a post directory yeah. and start labeling who lived at what address. And that would be an interesting project. But um, Yeah. And a case like this or a case like Zodiac is just so time consuming because just finding those historical yeah. historical records. Right. Like uh, right. this this stretch of Woodward Avenue, every address it, got changed back in 97 or something like that. Mm. So every address is different from what it was back uh, then, mm. yeah, which is why it was kind of difficult to pinpoint where some of them were. Um, 
so this just shows in that area, there's only one body, Stebbins, that was discarded in that area, which is why, you know, even Stebbins was probably taken out of this person's comfort zone, out of the area where they lived, resided. Um, but in the next slide, I think, go ahead, Lee. So here's the forensic countermeasure they did do is that with every abduction, they discarded the body further and further mm. away from the abduction. Ah, putting more distance. Exactly. Exactly. So Stebbins, the first two uh, were what? Stebbins and uh, Robinson? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. So they're roughly the same, right? About uh, whatever that is, a mm -hmm. three mile radius or something. Mm. And then with, uh, how do you pronounce, how do you pronounce Mihalik? Mihalik. Yeah. Mihalik. Yeah. Mihalik, obviously uh, quite a bit uh, further away and then King further away. So they were, they were getting more cautious, maybe nervous. Um, they were trying to spread out the bodies. Uh, so yeah, the, the press was all over it. Right. You know, at this, by this point, by the third one. And that's why they're okay. using the antiseptic with King too, right? It's showing the certain. Quite yeah. possibly. Yeah. So Definitely. one question, you guys keep talking about where this guy or these guys lived. Or this couple. Uh, okay. Offender. But I'm, I'm Offender. focusing on the lived part. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Could it have not been a residence, but a warehouse, a vacant building, a building that somebody owned where there were multiple people mm -hmm. watching? children not a residence but a place where they do this filming maybe you know things like definitely, that definitely and, owned. and then is it possible that they were holding more than one child at a time yes yeah, for the purpose of filming in the true case they had multiple children in mm -hmm. a, a very small house i think it was even like a terrace house potentially you know it's but then why the why not an overlap why not one victim abducted while the other one's still in being held? To me, it seems like they're discarding one, then picking up another one. And, you know, so to me, that goes away from from that. I mean, Unless there's other things out. that they're taking that didn't make our list, yeah. right? Exactly. I mean, th with these four, these things happen. But if this is a ring, possibly other children being abducted, trafficked to other places. I, th I think um, it's very important, though, to point out that there is no evidence looking at these crimes that it's a ring. And I think we're potentially making a mistake running with this. Like, well, they found a pedophile ring, so that must be it. But there's nothing about these crimes um, yes. besides maybe trying to explain why the girls were not sexually abused or seem not to have been sexually abused. That would indicate a pedophile ring. So we don't want to like, you know, we don't want to get stuck on that. I, I agree with you 100 percent because I think they went, they shine so many lights on that end of things, and the case is still unsolved. Uh, obviously, they found some very good potential suspects to make them think that it could be related to that. But you know, at the same time, I think you have to look at the other possibilities too, and not get tunnel vision on the uh, pedophile ring. Mm -hmm. I, I am with multiple offenders though. Now I think I'm. 100% with that. I agree with both of you. I, I think I think you have to be completely open-minded in, into, you know, a, a, a number of scenarios. And I, I don't think you want to get, you know, uh, when I was looking into this, I was looking into the, the, the you know, the network, the pedophile ring, um, the possibility of, a, obviously, a single, a single and multiple offenders. Um, but, you, I mean, you also don't want to get tunnel vision on age too, mm -hmm. right? So like that 10 to 12 boy and girl, I mean, if it is a ring, there could be an overlap. There could be a 16 year old girl there at the same time, mm -hmm. right? Like we, we just, it's, there's so many details that you need to have. And, you know, like when I was, when I just looking at the scenario of the pedophile ring and looking at timeline, you know, we notice a few things like, uh, you know, Lee mentioned Sunday and Wednesday, you know, yes, two were abducted on Sunday, two on Wednesday, one was discarded on Sunday, one was discarded on a Wednesday. Mm. Uh, the time of year, they were all taken in the winter. Uh, the year 76, 77, mm. and Stebbins was 76, and the other three were late 77. Um, so, you know, I was 
when I was looking at that, I was trying to think of, I think they were all late 77 as it was. Alex, you can correct me on that if I'm, uh, anyway, so oh, no. March 77, so 76 and 77. Actually, March 77 is the latest. Is the latest. So they're it, all. Is the final one. So that's really early in the year. Right. It's early 77. It's early 77. So, you know, when I was looking into that, I was asking myself, well, why these years? Well, you know, one thing, uh, VHS was created in 76 mm -hmm. and it was released Beta. in August beta before that and it was released in august 77 in the, in the u.s right mm -hmm. so there was you know just some of those is it a coincidence maybe um the sunday the wednesday something of significance probably work, for these offenders work schedule what about the holidays yeah the holiday christmas i mean it could be a something a christmas simple... day after new year's day after saint patrick's day day after valentine's day yeah exactly and it, it can I mean, time off and that, that could be, it can change significantly your analysis of that, depending on what scenario you're looking at. Mm -hmm. Well, how right? long do you, do you get time? You don't get time off on Valentine's Day or St. Patrick's Day, right? No. I'm not thinking I, mean, time off, I wasn't but sure about like, St. Patrick. Yeah. No. No. But they could be gifts. You should have the day after St. Oh, Saturday. yes. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. So. Okay, yeah. that's interesting. Yeah, so there's just a lot of things you can look at there. Um what else timeline wise? Oh, the winter months. So again, it's like the Zodiac case. It's hard with this case because, you know, why are they being abducted in the winter months? Well, I, I tried Tim to do King a, wasn't. I, I tried to do a, what's that? Tim King wasn't, it was March and I believe it was unseasonably warm. Okay. Yeah. It was March. So it was getting warmer to the spring. Um, uh, mm -hmm. but I was looking into that area, Woodward Avenue, uh, specifically, in 77 and in the summer there was major construction you could barely drive up and down it ah. so there's oh. a possibility that in 77 in the summer they didn't continue because of the construction and they took away their hunting grounds so that's a mm -hmm. possibility but again going back you, i mean you have to look at the time you know what was happening on sundays in that area what was happening on wednesdays mm -hmm. what was right what was what kid events were going on that was significant it's just such a deep dive to find i out. worked yeah. I worked a job in sales and you weren't allowed to sell on Sundays. I don't know what the rule is in Michigan, but so our days off for every Sunday and we had one day off during the week, each mm. person, had, each salesperson had a different day off Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Mm. So I wonder if it could be some kind of job related thing that this person can only do their abducting and dumping on their days off. And therefore they're off on Sundays and Wednesdays. That's what I was. Yeah, quite possibly. You know, it's salesman is uh it's a driving profession right frequently well found. it could be auto sales could be uh, a number of different things um and i don't know what the blue laws are in michigan that's what they're called blue laws mm -hmm. about right. not being able to sell certain things on sundays but in new jersey where i lived you couldn't do it on sundays so on sundays it was an, everybody was off and then they also had a different day off during a weekday so that would be interesting to look at and that's something again maybe that's another clue that can really narrow down you know, could you imagine knowing what days off this person had if that was the reason for those two days and knowing that your suspect had these days off from their job? That would seem like a major uh, clue if that was the case. Mm -hmm. hmm. What about this one, Doug? So this one just identifies the, the routes that were used to discard these bodies. Uh, again, they were uh, major roads or highways and they were used to get the body out of the area quickly and you know they were they were obviously familiar with these roads because they were the major roads but they were just used to get the body out of the area fast they weren't worried about concealing it getting seen they just wanted to get it out dump it along a major road um so those routes were significant i didn't draw a route to the king body deposition site because i don't know how they got to that site right the others are kind of in a loop but the king is out so i didn't know where to start it from probably down near around where stebbins was and if that's the case they would have gone straight out that what is it 102 um possibly so um but it just shows the roots that these that they're likely using to discard these bodies hmm 
I'm just flagging some comments. So yeah, no, oh, great. Going. Perfect. If you guys have any, no. jump in. I can't wait to see what the listeners have to say and what their theories are. So here. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, that's Doug. okay. Uh, so I've identified in the white polygon shape there where I think that these kids were being held based on this. Now, there's several reasons for that. One, if they were in the middle of that blue loop, right? If they were in the middle, why are they going all the way out, traveling seven miles to get to a major artery and then out? It doesn't really make sense. And if they, they would just go up Woodward Avenue one way or the other. So they're, I think they were on an intersection of those main routes. They could jump on quickly out and back in minutes minutes um the other thing that made me think is they're getting the bodies away from where they abducted so it can't be close to stebbins so stebbins is inside that red circle mm -hmm. right so it already gives you a clue of where it is it's got to be away from stebbins somewhat so it's got to be away from stebbins and in my opinion it's likely very close to one of those arteries to get out of there fast. So it's I, so it's along that, I believe, you're likely looking in that area along there. And you know if any of the suspects are in there, I would prioritize them just based off of uh, off where they live. Very interesting. I'd weight them heavier. Uh, no, this isn't my graphic. This is a graphic I pulled off online. Uh, it, it's a pretty good graphic. It just shows the abduction and where they were, where the bodies, where the kids were picked up from and left um i tried to find a source for it but i couldn't and uh but it was a it, it's a fairly good graphic there okay let's get to some comments then um hold on here we are cat daddy steve said washing the bodies a religious ritual hmm but they weren't washed were they alex it was a myth you're muted very likely a myth. Okay. Um, he also says, uh, male nurse, paramedic, son of a medical professional. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Could Potentially. Be. Cat Daddy Steve says, a gay male offender in those days would not be openly married or obviously partnered. Well, he's not gay. Yeah, I mean, he's not gay. Of, there's plenty of uh, pedophiles that have, will abuse yeah. men who are, they're, they're not gay. It's a different thing altogether. Yeah, we need Jody on. Jody Plache. Yeah, that would be a good idea. Yeah. Um, Kathy Arnott said, if the gremlin was <laughs> not part, part of it, why didn't he come forward? They oh, getting interviewed of <laughs> thousands yeah. of people in gremlins. One guy was stopped 23 times. And cleared. And he mm -hmm. finally said, can you give me a pass to put on my car <laughs> at this point? So, and, and according to uh, Elbrooks Patterson, even despite the unconstitutional search, people were like, yeah, go for it. Search my car. They were more than happy to yeah. comply. Um, so why didn't he come forward? There were a lot of blue AMC gremlins now, back then. So how about the one specifically parked at that location where the victim's brother found it and right where the other witness saw, did they identify that particular right. person and that particular I gremlin? Don't know. Um, what I have so far is okay. So you have Chris's report of seeing that gremlin and, and everybody. Okay. To, to give our listeners a little preview. The gremlin was who they were looking for. They were pretty sure this guy that was seen talking to Tim outside, standing next to the gremlin, was the killer. And that he drove this gremlin. That's what he was using to abduct the children. Well, Chris sees the car there late that night. And there was another witness, I need to find out who, that when they went back, there was enough frost on the car that they determined that car had never moved from the time it originally parked in the parking lot to late that night or even possibly the next morning. I might be wrong about that. So that's why um, many believe that the gremlin was a red herring and was never used. And we need to look at the the Skylark, Tempest, and Le Mans because there are more, mm -hmm. uh, more if you know this because you watched the same documentary and we 
been studying the same stuff, mm -hmm. there are more mentions of this car and this car or this make and model of car is going to become relevant again when we talk about suspects. We know that's connected to it. I will say this though, yeah. not not to spoil too much, but yeah, the gut the sketch of the gremlin guy looks yeah. a lot like one of the pedophile suspects that we'll get into. Yes. If I had to pick one person that looked like that sketch, that guy looks yep. a lot like that sketch. Yep. And he happens to be the same person who said, hey, my buddy killed Mark Stevens. Kim, Kim. Said, if no. Appleman was approached by the perp, I wonder if other children were also approached. Were kids in the area interviewed? Were there any who came forward as adults to tell what happened to them? That's a very good question. Yeah. Uh, that's going to, I mean, I would have to review every single thing that has ever been, you know, done in this case. And that's just not going to happen. Um, I'm sure they did. I mean. Are you? There were, with regard to suspects in this case, there were children, victims, hmm. who were interviewed. Okay. Um, so, yeah. And, and we don't know that Appleman was approached by the perp. I mean, there were a number of abductions of children and young people at this time. Many of them have been ruled unrelated or they've been solved or they've claimed they've solved them. So, I mean, I mean, back in the seventies, we used to get warned all the time. A guy pulls up next to you, run. You don't talk to the stranger in the car. Right. It Why was that common. Pulls up. Well, we were told not to talk to anybody in cars. Yeah. If you didn't know him, you didn't get in a car, just mm -hmm. period. Um, but it's interesting that you bring up the woman because of a certain piece of forensic evidence that was found in one of these cars. Okay. Which was? They were only fine able, it was a hair. Mm -hmm. And they were only able to find a mitochondrial match. So it had to go through, and I wish Susanna was here because I'm not going to explain this correctly. Mm -hmm. It had to be, the only way they could search was for a family member related to a female. Mm -hmm. Because the sample didn't have any non-girly DNA. I really can't talk about this stuff. Though. So, and on the, along those lines, Susanna will be here next week, right? So for yes, listeners absolutely. that are listening. Well, I hope she will. I told her we need her next yeah, week. Yeah, we need so. her DNA expertise in this yeah. one in a big way because there's a lot yeah. of, a lot of important information. Yeah. Another thing I was going to say is there could have been dozens of attempts at abduction that oh, yeah. weren't suspicious, oh, right? Like, the idea was one four for four is it's unlikely, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. If there was a ruse used, any kind of ruse, right? Hey, can you mm -hmm. show me directions? Do you, want, do you want to pet my dog? And the kid doesn't bite. Mm -hmm. Right? There right. could have been could have been dozens of them. Right. And, and really, said, you'd hope that they would raise some kind of awareness about that. Like, you might not be aware that you got away from an abduction. Mm -hmm. Right. It could be totally. something like, you know, can you give me directions? No. I got to go. And they don't right. think about it again. When I was right. a kid, I just a, a quick story. When I was a kid. I was hanging outside talking to some friends and this old guy came along and he was, you could, I could tell, even though I was a kid, I could tell he was bullshit. And I said, I'm guessing I was nine, 10 years old telling us that he was like a, an advisor to president Reagan and all this other shit. Right. So I'm like, I know this guy's bullshit. Us. Well, <laughs> lo and behold, one or two of my friends slowly disappear and it's just me and this creepy guy. Mm. And he said, do you want to go down the lake and fool around? And I, even oh. though I was young, I knew what he meant. And yeah. I just, I took off running, mm -hmm. went in, got my dad. My dad came out with a bat. By the time he got out, this guy was gone. Long story short, that's as far as it went. And my dad said, if you ever see that guy again, come get me right away. Mm -hmm. Never saw the guy again. We never went any further telling the police about it. So I no, wonder if didn't. there could be, if there was an incident there, something along right. those lines mm -hmm. where, okay, the kid got away watch out don't we, get in cars with anybody after that that could be an instance right. where, where this and person we did didn't, that away before we did we minimalized it you know the guy um it, not the guy but you know you have your typical weenie wagger that's out there jerking off in somebody's window oh he's harmless this was the era of oh he's harmless mm -hmm. and so How we didn't if some guy 
if some guy came up and it happened a lot doing, you know, things like what you're talking about, Morph, some guy would come up, expose himself to us girls. We'd laugh and run away. We didn't call police. We mm. told our parents if we felt really threatened. But overall, it wasn't considered a big deal. Yeah. Which is weird because they used they used to be like maybe not in the seventies, but you know there was a time where it was like no sex in our movies, okay. please. I don't want my I want my children seeing a rated R film with like well that was in the seventies, man. Sex right, was but, everywhere. But if some guy like jacks off in front of them as they're coming down the slide, that's just that's and just, this was the time when father, we right? ran them off. Weird. Yeah. The statute of limitations on rape back at this time was like three, four, five years, something stupid like that. If so I mean, that. This, this was the time we were dealing with. Yeah. Now yeah. there'd be social media that guy that pervert's face would be plastered all over social media everybody would be running out of their houses looking for the guy in, in a minute so now i mean it's just a sign of the times that it would be mm -hmm. hard to do what this person is doing now um they wouldn't be able to get away with it but imagine more back um when d'angelo was just weenie wagging and looking in windows yeah, yeah. he was harmless oh he's just yeah. harmless yeah he's just it's peeping like through people's harmless. windows and <laughs> people also just turn away a lot thinking like they're crazy mm -hmm. right and like the story mm -hmm. i have just before covid i was coaching soccer and the girls team i was coaching was i mean they were 14 years old anyway we went to uh new york city for a tournament and we were on the subway going down to manhattan for dinner and on the subway in the car there was a guy sitting there oh, yeah. jerking jerking off mm -hmm. and we had to get all the 14 year old girls and turn them away and get them away. But he's just sitting on the car yep. in the subway doing that. That's a typical yep. day on, on the subway in New York. <laughs> crazy. Well, was this guy, there was a guy in Philadelphia who did it with Swiss cheese. Oh, Ew, that's stinky. <laughs> it's weird. weird. It's gonna okay. Now I have to ask thing. because Swiss cheese has holes in it. How was he using the Swiss cheese? It'd be weird if he didn't. Right. <laughs> right. Mr. doesn't have very yeah. big holes in it. Well, I dated I a lot. Could could I make make one big hole? <coughs> I think we have to to segue to Kim's. Okay. Do we know? Oh, Kim says I was given chlorhexidine in a four ounce bottle before I had surgery. I was supposed to use it in the shower two days in a row to kill all germs by the surgery. Yes, I have a bottle of it in that I use on my animals and. Steve got it after his lung surgery. It's very common, but it's a different, it's a different derivative than what they, than Pfizer And I was trying to find which one was banned, um, but I, it got all confusing. Yeah. If this person was doing that, you know, there's a couple of reasons you could theorize why they would be putting this on them. If they were putting it on more than one of the victims, one to keep them clean, as we talked about, or maybe they thought somehow it would kill evidence. But back then, what was the most they could no, a blood type. Um, yeah. Maybe they thought it would clean hairs off them, whatever, but they wouldn't know about DNA. No, they Semen, wouldn't. Right, secretor, non-secretor. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Kim said, glad to see dogs on it. Every time I hear about a new case in an outside area, I think somebody called dog. <laughs> well, it's a getting to the point where that's exactly what I do. Doug, are you available? And I always like it. Doug will go out on the line on. And, and put where he thinks the person lives instead of like bouncing around and saying, ah, I can't, I don't want to, you know, he, he mans up and, and says where he thinks it's uh, the sweet spot is for the, the suspect. I like that. I did that for you today, Morph. <laughs> I know. I, I, it could, I it could change, but. <laughs> um, Cat Daddy Steve said back to the semi rural large property grandparents homestead with the big detached garage in the overgrown yard. Yeah, potentially. Mm -hmm. And this could be somebody who has rich parents that are vacationing at their lake home now more for, for weeks at a time. And this person has the house to themselves for a good portion of time and has mm -hmm. something, you know, uh, I feel like you and Cat and Daddy are both, both hinting at the same thing here. This is why you don't look at the suspects before you, you do the profile. No, I I, I don't because it, if, if that's where you're going with it, I'm not a big fan of the suspects they put forward mm -hmm. in like the documentary um, myself, which I'll get into next episode, I guess, why as to why. The only thing on that comment I would say is 
you still have to think it, that could very well be the case, but you have to think rural 1977, mm. right? Not rural looking at any maps now. Mm. So, and again, I go back to if the person is somebody that always has kids with them because they have kids or their family's always over with their kids, it looks normal. If it's a single guy that's not supposed to have kids and somebody sees him with kids, it's really going to stand out. So I think they had to be real careful moving these kids in and out. I think they had to be careful, but even, I mean, even Castro got those women to his basement without people yeah. noticing. Right? Yeah. So, I mean, it can mm -hmm. happen in a subdivision, but. I, I live right there. in the middle of a, of a town. Like it's 30 seconds for me to, to walk to a shop. Um, but my property is such that if I abducted someone, I could get them into my property and no one would see. There's, yeah. there's just all kinds of options, right? So, I mean, Detroit suburbs outside of Detroit, how far back then, Doug, would we have had to travel to get to a rural area from? I mean, Oakland County, not not far, right? Because. I mean, you look at it now, it's all developed with subdivisions around there. Back then, you'd have the main commercial area along Woodward Avenue. Mm -hmm. But then you, then I'm sure if you pulled up maps back then, you're going to have like farmer's fields. You know, I, I think of the closest town to where I live right now. It's town. I say it's about 130, 150,000 people now. And 20 years ago, there was nothing there nothing there was a uh right. a grocery store and now there's every mm -hmm. mcdonald's walmart you can think of right all the farmers fields yeah. are gone and that's just in 20 years so back in 1977 i mean you guys have to think like rural could have been like okay here's your main commercial dis like strip and then half a mile of farmers fields and then there's a property so it might not have been far off the strip You'd really okay, yeah, that's up. what I was getting at. You know, you didn't, you didn't have to go 10 mm -hmm. miles out, you know what I mean? So to get rural, right. all you have to do is be private. So it could be a rural property, but that might not have to be very far away. You don't have to go out to the country to get there. No, yeah. exactly. This is an interesting point. If he, they made photos, film, you would think that evidence would surface after decades floating around in some form found during a future arrest. Well, that's a good point. What yeah. you know? What happens to all the child porn that's made? Like the more, I don't know. I guess are you making lots of copies of it? I don't know anything about this topic. Yeah, I, I could imagine with the internet, it's on there forever. In, in the documentary, There's... they mentioned it was getting shipped overseas. Yeah, to Amsterdam. Oh yeah. Um. So fact, there are a couple presumptions in what Cat Daddy Steve is saying here. Um. That the pornography would be floating around and would turn up this is private stuff people don't i mean yes they distribute it but once you get your thing you keep it in your private collection also presumption that there would be a future arrest yeah. how do we know that i mean not every single pedophile or user of child pornography is arrested so, so these could still be you know under at arrest. some point do these guys who have these child porn connection uh, collections let's go okay well I'm past that now. I better destroy it. It's the, or, or like, do you think there's families that like they're cleaning out, you know, yeah. dad's room or something like that, and they they and they maybe they don't look at it. It's like this could be mixed in with Playboys or whatever, right? You just mm -hmm. throw it out. But you 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 know too that there's people who have found child porn mm -hmm. and said, "Fucking just burn it," right? And yep. I can understand that. It's like, okay, do yep. I want now to deal with all this? Mm -hmm. Like what? What is now that he's dead? What is the use of bringing the fact to, to the world's attention that my dad was into child pornography? Mm -hmm. Well, and maybe right. a suspect in this case, if they had it, wants to get rid of any evidence tying themselves to it, so they would burn it. I mean, or any of his brethren, for the same reasons, might not want to be linked to the case, and they might say, "Oh my God, that's that kid that yeah. got killed. I'm not keeping this stuff." Yeah, but if you're some guy in Amsterdam. What yeah. the hell do you care? Yeah. You know, then, and, but, and the production quality of this kind of stuff back in the 70s was not great. So the chances of being able to identify, to, you know, concretely identify a victim, uh, it's not like it is, is today. I mean, we didn't have, you know, as much in terms of photo enhancement and things like that. So it may have been very, very difficult. 
to identify victims. I think it's still a lot of it is still kicking around out there. Obviously, photos, oh, yeah. Betamax, VHS. And mm -hmm. in a way, and obviously with every passing day, it's going to get harder to find that stuff because who has a Betamax or VHS player anymore, right? Mm -hmm. And like Lee said, you find the stuff, you just throw it out. You know, I know I right. have a hundred VHS type tapes at my parents' mm -hmm. garage just sitting there that we, they haven't thrown out yet. But it's also, and I'm sure there's a method used by people in this network, but it was safer for them to have VHS tapes. Yes, if they get caught with it in their house, it doesn't look good on them and that sucks, but it's a lot easier to mail a VHS tape and keep it than try to conceal stuff on the internet because there's people right. out there better than you at finding this stuff on the internet. I actually, I went to school and one of, one of my uh, lecturers, he was uh, like a, a world foremost expert in in, and this is what he does. He was cyber investigator for child pornography working out of Malaysia, I think. Um, and uh, I mean, if you have it online, it's very risky, which most of them do these days, but I'm sure it was a lot safer for them to have it in hard, mm -hmm. in hard copy form. Yep. My mother back in the early seventies worked at a photo lab and her boss was, a real piece of shit. And she would, she was developed the one developing the photos and she would often get orders of child pornography of rape. And it was just, yeah, don't, don't look at it. Just give it, you know, process it for the customer. It's just, it wasn't treated the same way we treat it now. It was something gross. It was something dirty. It was something shameful. But like we've talked about, you threw it away if you didn't want it. And we're also assuming that this stuff is made into pornography. We don't know that for sure. This is just one of the right. possible theories. Right. And then what is a red herring? It's, you find out there's this child porn ring and then you start to reason back. But there's nothing in the in, in the evidence that we've looked at that shows child porn ring. Right. Um, so, you know, but what we do have is we do have, I think we have behavioral evidence of, of at least two different people involved in this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm revising my profile next time. Um, or maybe that one I gave you today would be for like a single offender or something like that. But I'm going to give you a different one. To be um, continued. Mm -hmm. Kim, uh, a little lighter, talked about this was definitely my era. I'm embarrassed to admit. I think I had that Donnie and Marie album. I traded him with my cousin for Sean yes. Cassidy, the do Ron Ron. You damn Ron right Ron you did, because Sean Cassidy the, was the shit. The do Ron Ron Ron, the do Ron Ron. Is that the tune? Yes, That's he from covered it. His whole wow. his whole first album, Sean Cassidy, Sean Cassidy, was all covers. And there's no reason, Kim, that you should be embarrassed. We grew up in the 70s. This was a fine generation to be a child. Um, yeah, the Sean Cassidy was my first heartthrob. My only experience with him was the Hardy Boys. I love the Hardy Boys. I couldn't, I couldn't, you couldn't peel me away from it. Yeah. And actually, Steve, my partner, had the same agent as uh, the Partridge family and Sean Cassidy, wow. Ruth Aarons. They were on the same, same studio, same level. Nice. So he met Sean Cassidy, and I never got to. Cat Daddy Steve said, winter farmers, plant nursery, and landscapers have a lot of time on their hands in the winter. Okay. Kimberly Gordon. Interesting that it seems chlorhexidine gluconate was not introduced in the U.S. until the 1970s and appears the application was hand washing in the healthcare setting. So perhaps looking for someone connected to the healthcare industry and could be anyone that was a care provider down to supply chain for healthcare organizations and anywhere in between. And mm. having off on Sunday and Wednesdays would be a nice bonus. Mm. So what do you think? Are we ready to head into the scrum and continue the conversation? Let Ashley come up. Well, let's answer this one. Emily Dietrich says, wait, did I miss mention of DNA? No DNA preserved. Um, we're going to ask Suzanne about that next week. Yep. Um, part two. Part, part two. two. 
Um, yeah. Okay. So should we go to the scrum, bring Ashley up? I'll make a cup of tea. Sounds good. Okay, hold on. Ashley Singular. You're muted, Ashley. I'm so sorry. I knew I was going to do that today. That's okay. okay. I'll do every week. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to thank our new patron, Jane Yu, and all our returning DD, DDA agents. Also, thanks to everyone who's chosen to listen for an Abjack Insider subscription. If you're considering joining the ranks of the DDA, here's the info. The Nancy Drew tier gives you ad-free episodes, bonus content, and the Scrum. The Scrum is an after-hours with our hosts and guests where the conversation continues. The Columbo tier contains the perks of the first, plus a guarantee that at least one of your comments or voicemails will be heard on the show. The Poirot tier contains the perks of the first and second, plus access to a quarterly private session where members will join and interact with one or more hosts to discuss cases not explored on the show. Think of it as a masterclass where you and the hosts dig e even deeper into your pet case. The fourth and final is Sherlock Holmes, which contains all perks so far, plus a VIP pass to any special in-person event where you can meet and mingle with the hosts of Citizen Detective. As we grow, there will be a lot more coming your way, so watch this space. Head on over to www.patreon.com slash Citizen Detective. But if Patreon isn't your thing, but you still want to get every episode of Citizen Detective ad-free, plus get any bonus content and access to our after-hours show, The Scrum, don't forget you can get all of that with an Abjack Insider subscription on Apple Podcasts. Just head over to Apple Podcasts and search for our show, Citizen Detective, or the Abjack Entertainment channel to sign up and start getting VIP access right away. Citizen Detective streams every two weeks on YouTube at Citizen Depod on Twitter, at Citizen Detective Podcast on Facebook, and twitch.tv slash Citizen Detective. Back to the show. Thank you, Ashley. Okay, so Morph, shall we talk over Lee's chair? Yeah, let's talk over his chair. Hi, hi, Lee's chair. So Lee's chair, what did you think of your boss's profile tonight? Um, I thought it was. Uh, I thought it was interesting. Um, I, you know, I like how he's expanding the possibilities of of shifting mm -hmm. a little bit to, to another scenario. Um, this case is just it's teeming with possible red herrings. I mean, the the, the pedophile angle just seems so like it's such an e easy avenue to go down. There's so many suspects surrounding that well, in that area. Don't give us from everyone. Keep going. Yep. We're in it. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think um, it, it just makes for an interesting exploration, but I, I try not to get too hung up on just that. And, you know, in next week's episode, when we talk about the suspects more in detail, I'll share why why I'm not so high on them. Um, and, and speaking of that, since I know we have a lot to cover, how many total episodes do you think this is going to be? Because we've got you, polygraphs, the DNA. Free. Yeah, I think I think that might be the sweet spot for this case because there's a lot of stuff yeah. to look over. Um, there is, I, and I, and I how the the evidence in those polygraphs uh, intertwine with the suspects. You know how the information was discovered how it wasn't ever explored in any great length in the original investigation. Um, yeah, I, I, I totally agree with you. And I'm hoping, I'm trying to get a hold of some of the major players in this case, uh, not players in the case, but um, uh, Mr. Appleman, 
Jay Ruben Appleman. I have reached out to him. I'm hoping we can get him on because he's done, in addition to Detective Corey Williams, who is, I believe, in charge of the task force now, um, they've done so much research. And Kathy King, Kathy Broad, seems that she has all the documents. She has all the case files. Mm. And so they have uncovered just basically what the families believe at this point is that either law enforcement completely screwed up just and just were negligent in the investigation or they were covering up for one of the suspects in the case or one of the potential persons of interest in the case who may have been related to law enforcement. Yeah, that so was that's generally what the families believe right now. It's an interesting angle, that law enforcement connection that I'm, I'm sure we're going to talk about that. Yeah. Um, now, I, I I tend to shy away from that. You know, that when anybody that's going to cover up, whether it's law enforcement or not, going to cover up for somebody that did this to a, a you know handful of children, I, I just can't see them covering quote unquote covering it up and people not coming forward to mm -hmm. say absolutely not i'm having no part in covering this up right so to me i tend to go away from that that but i can see why the families based on the the, the amount of stuff that hasn't been mm -hmm. yeah dumped upside down and, and looked through i could see exactly. why they would start thinking things like that and when they're finding you know well we were never told this and well they said this but this is what we're really reading here in these reports they don't know what to trust. So, mm -hmm. you know, you know, something in terms of these, this suspect cesspool. Um, I feel, you know, one of the things that I felt accumulating all of this information was that there is a narrative that has been created that maybe these suspects were involved but maybe the narrative that's been laid on top of it is incorrect. Yeah. And I, I think what's really going to be interesting is when we get to the physical evidence, mm -hmm. it sort of overlaps the suspects in a variety of ways. And this is where we're yep. going to really need Susanna to help us dissect yes. that evidence because it's, it's, you know, if, if you're looking at that evidence, it, it definitely seems to connect to that pedophile community. Um, to that community, yeah. To that community, yeah. and whether it's them rogue, away from the rest of them doing it on their own, or the other ones have some involvement or some knowledge of it or some participation. Mm -hmm. it, you know, that's it, obviously... But but the, I go back to, with the, the amount of lot spotlight being shined on that community, you think if there's something to be found, they would have found it. And then again, maybe they did and they just, oh, they passed the polygraph test. He's got to be innocent. Exactly. And mm -hmm. if it was that simple, you know, that's just, that's just wrong to rule somebody out strictly on a polygraph test, especially as we know, they're not, you know, yeah. they're not used in court for a reason. And they um, weren't then. But yeah. I, and you saw in the documentary, uh, I think it was Marty Rich Keenan was talking about, how at the time polygraph was relative, the new technology of polygraph, not that polygraphing was new, but the, what new technology they had, yeah. that was the be all and end all, she said, of investigations, just like DNA, we're treating DNA now, you know, oh, well, if we have DNA, we can solve it or we can exclude. That's what they were doing with polygraphs. I, I think they really need to do the case of service and go back and identify everybody that was ruled out just from a polygraph. Mm -hmm and rule them out via other ways. Did that person also have an alibi because they were in another state? Did they, were they clocked in at work 45 minutes mm -hmm. away? I mean, are there other yeah. things that can rule them out, but just saying they passed a polygraph. Right. I, I and think then it's foolish to, to rule them out. All these decades way. later, good luck being able to track all that information. Yeah. Stuff gets lost, yeah. gets thrown out. And then, you know, the, and again, not trying to throw a monkey wrench into what we're going to talk about or spoil it too much, but, and, uh, you know, along those lines with the polygraph, somebody comes out with a piece of information, that nugget of, you know, the polygraph convention um, yeah. comes forward and says, hey, I heard this at a polygraph convention, but they wouldn't tell me. It stars a name. A you know, it's like, OK, I just it's frustrating to have that um, happen and not have that 
make any headway. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I hope they're doing stuff like Doug does and doing some um, geo profiling behind the scenes to see if they, you know, thought they could have done yeah, I'm hoping, with. and and pardon me for offering you up, Doug, but I'm hoping that with your appearance on here, that if somebody sees it, if they're not doing geographic pro profiling, that they reach out to you. Because I think that's absolutely critical in this case. Yeah, no, I mean, by all means do. And I think this case would be great for if, if you guys got a hold of this case officially in any capacity or working with the people that have the case files, you know, I'd happily uh, uh, work with you on the case. I think it's a, I think it's a great case and I think it's solvable or mm -hmm. I think it can be some kind of resolution, whatever that may be. Resol resolved. Yes. Yeah. Right. It would be good to know if any of the suspects live in Doug's cluster. I'd love to know that when we talk about them, see if we can find out what their dresses were at the time and see if they lived yeah. in that cluster. Yeah, anywhere. I mean, anywhere in that red circle. Mm -hmm. so what would be useful would but, be to know where fried chicken was served or sold. K KFC probably back then, all yeah. over the place. There were yeah, probably KFCs KFC. left and right and yeah. fast food joints that sold it. Um, Honestly, if you put when KFC, KFC have its big. Uh, when was KFC big? Seventies, seventies, sixties, and seventies through the eighties. But yeah, big and huge in the seventies. Because yeah. bigger it was the then than it is now, I think. I think there's yeah, more oh, KFC definitely than, than, than now. Because it was it was still Kentucky Fried Chicken. Mm -hmm. um, the Colonel was still representing, and yeah, it was the first fast food that provided a family meal. And not yeah. just burgers and fries. So yeah, it was huge. And, and then that brings up an interesting point. So we talked about uh, the police theorized that this guy was watching their press conference. What if he was just like saying, "Hey, this is your last meal, kid. What do you want for dinner?" That crossed my mind. That I mean, that that'd be happen. really cold. But he was like, I'm, "This kid's gonna mm -hmm. die tonight, so I'm gonna get him what he wants for his last meal." Or, Maybe never or he wasn't watching. It. Make... His wife was right. And, and that's why it'd be interesting, you know, that fried chicken, it would be interesting to get the stomach contents and see what specifically was in the recipe of the fried chicken, exactly. if they can actually do that, right? Yeah. Because, you know, then you could say, well, it, oh, it's just KFC. Uh, mm -hmm. But maybe it wasn't. Maybe it was homemade. Maybe it was from another restaurant. And being back in the 70s, I wonder how far they could go with that. I wonder how far down that trail they could, they could go. There's a, uh, currently there's a KFC directly in between where King and Robinson were abducted. Now, whether that was there back in 77, I don't know. Doug and I are finally um, working on something in an official capacity together where we can't really talk about it. It's, it's really exciting though, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And it's, it's big. It's going to, it's going to take a lot of work, but it's, it, it is exciting. Mm -hmm. Tease. You guys are teases. Hmm. Well, it's, it's cereal. Mm -hmm. A few things, but yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> um, so we, we're going to do one more of these of Oakland Two. County. Two. Okay. Um, all right. Then, then what? Well, you wanted to take a look. Well, we uh, if we can get a good episode out of that missing girl. Um, other than that, you had mentioned wanting to do the Santa Rosa Hitchhikers. Yes. Um, there's some European cases I like, too. Did, did you say Monster of Florence didn't perform that well, Morph? Uh, yeah, but I'll, I'll talk about that with you over the, off the air. Okay. I'm yeah. just wondering if it was because it was European. There's a lot of good European cases. Uh yeah, we did get a request from a international viewer asking if we do more. So mm -hmm. we didn't do Bible John yet, did we? No, we have not. Bible John's good. Have to get Doug on that one. Anyone called Doug McGregor's got to weigh in on a Glaswegian serial killer. I remember you. You, you asked me about Bible John a couple of years ago. So. Did I? Yeah. Yeah. It'd be an interesting case. It's inter it is an interesting one because you have so much, um, so many people just like 
sat for hours listening to this guy talk, saying yeah. weird things repeatedly. That's the one where he left he left the body at a golf course, right? No, no. Didn't he? No, he didn't. There was something about a golf No, there's that's me going off on my, on my uh hmm. was, was he a Freemason thing and there was a golf course near the uh not in like a conspiracy way, was yeah, he, yeah. you know, but like um he had a ring that he had hidden and um he seemed to be from yeah, I'd have to do my research, yeah. I don't know much about the case. There's the uh, things left in rivers downstream from a golf course uh, yeah huh. and uh there's all pickup sites at the same area the barrel and ballroom but then he travels home with them sometimes he walks sometimes he cabs it but then he's got to make it back and then he takes items from them and he drops you know they'll show up in different huh. places later interesting yeah Yeah, so there's no there's no end to it, the and you know just when I think I know them all, I never heard of the Santa Rosa hitchhiker thing. Mm -hmm. That was another one brought up by a viewer, and there's no end to these cases. Well, I, I wasn't even familiar with this case until Alex contacted me. So I was I surprised. Being in Michigan, I thought there was a good chance you worked on it. No. Because it's up by you in the Great White North area of the world. Before my time. Yeah. No, I mean later on the, you know, in the recent years. Yeah, no. It's this a, is another book on the case, which I read um, a long time ago, so I forgot all the suspects. But um, Wolf in Sheep's Clothing, The Search for the uh, for a Child Killer by Tommy McIntyre. I think he was a journalist. This came out in the 80s. That car is so distinct, too, that hockey stick emblem. Oh mm -hmm. God, they were everywhere. And, but I did they everyone have that emblem on there? No, they didn't. But I certainly, okay. I mean, the, when I first saw that car, I'm like, oh God, that car, that gr I remember the green gremlin. I remember gremlins, oh. but I don't remember hockey yeah. stick emblem on there. But that's yeah, oh, so I do. Distinctive. Yeah. And then there was the pacer that was really the lame version of the gremlin, even. Also AMC. Yeah, the comic book guy in The Simpsons drove an AMC gremlin. Mm -hmm. He seemed like a suspicious character. Ponytail, greasy ponytail. Yeah, this is a case where I, I feel like I I almost want to pick up a Polk's directory from the seventies there and just scan yeah. the streets and just you know. It and I want to do that with you because this is one I just yeah. I wish we. <clears throat> you could you could literally lay I, out I every single one person and, and then yeah. one at a time see if any of them had. Sexual related. Well, well hold on. And... we're looking for something for our citizen detectives to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This would be something that would they'd put them to really good practical use. Yeah. I mean, and you can find Pokes directories online um, at the library. Um, mm -hmm. Some of them are on ancestry.com. So you could, you could lay out these areas in Doug's circle if we knew all the names of the streets and maybe we can put out a version where the streets are enlarged so you could see some of the street names and figure out who's in, in that area. But you literally can go one at a time and just see if any of those names are people that were picked up for any kind of crimes mm. related to, you know, and maybe it is a pedophile, but just not the pedophiles they've been looking at. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or the frightening thing, maybe it's somebody that doesn't even have a record. Or a record for uh, for something else. Yeah, right? yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and if you're going with the idea of, uh, of of a couple, and he's like this dominant male partner, um, then he may have he may be more generally criminal. Yeah. You know. Um, I still, I look at the clues in the case, and and Doug really struck me with that Sunday and Wednesday thing. The fact they're all either abducted or picked or dumped on Sundays and, and Wednesdays. Mm -hmm. No, there was a bunch dumped on Thursdays, wasn't there? I mean, was it Thursday? I thought it was two days. I think they were take they were taken on Sundays and Wednesdays. Taken on Sundays and Wednesdays. Right. Let me just check my notes to make sure that's okay. Yeah. One yeah. was one was also dumped on a Sunday. Yeah. Sunday, Wednesday, Sunday, Wednesday. Wednesday. Sunday, Sunday, Wednesday. Wednesday. Yeah. So that's significant. Also, yeah. That's significant. There, there's a reason for that. It's just not just a coincidence. So. I, I think that's maybe a huge clue and, and may who knows. And that's, what's great about the show. Cause we can get to talking about things as a group 
was that something that the police noticed? Was that an angle they looked at already? I don't know about that. I know the holiday thing has been on their mind. The Sunday Wednesday is even more specific, yeah. though. It's not. Yeah, it's, it's less significant. You know, that's a lot of movie stuff. Like, oh, it was like Valentine's Day, and it reminded mm -hmm. him of his lost love. So then he killed oh. kids or something, mm -hmm. something to work like that. I mean, but I like what Doug said about gifts. Yeah, potentially that 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 jibes for me. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of uh, there's, there's a lot of different avenues of investigation, I guess, that just end up being nothing. Like, I mean, the one of the in this one is the uh, is it Robinson that was near the police station? It, it, her body was in sight of the police I station, so, yeah. the and the, it, the offender was possibly taunting the police. Yeah, and, see, know. I'm not. I'm not convinced of no, that. You know, there's detachments no. all over the place. It kind of goes back to, well, the other thing it reminded me of is the, the Zodiac, right? When he made mm -hmm. the phone call near the police station. Well, when mm -hmm. I was looking at that case for, for Morph and for Lee is that I was trying to find a record of where pay phones were back then. Maybe it was the only pay phone in that area. I don't know, but it's well, just. Well, is not massive either. So you're never going to be too far from the police station, right? That, and that's exactly the same with, with this. If he's in that area, he's never going to be too far from that police station either, right? In this case. Right. So just... And again, I want to see photos of where that body is in proximity to that police station. Is it just in the area or is it so near that, you know, if they looked out, they would have seen the body. I mean, again, we go back to, you know, the use of floral language and hyperbole and describing something when it may not be the accurate description. Yeah. Like in the Zodiac case, for example, they said that the phone booth that he called from was in sight of the police station. That's not true. You couldn't see that phone booth from that police station. So no. yeah, that's just a uh, a bit of a myth, too. I mean, if you look mm -hmm. at it on a line from where it's at, it looks like you could, but there's buildings and stuff on the, on the route that would be in its view. So it's not like they were taunting the police. I think that, you know. Yeah. Why be my, subtle about taunting the police, right? Like you could always send a body part to the yeah, police station yeah. or a letter or piece of clothing. Yeah. 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 His jacket. You know, the hockey jacket. Do. Yeah. I don't think that I don't think that they were attempting to communicate on on that level. I think that any communications, um, it's like it's like a form of undoing. And what I'll do actually is, ah, oh God, I wish we could know for sure though about the about the posing. Oh, well, I'm going to dig and see how many more reports I can find. And Lee, one thing we didn't mention, we didn't talk about, but now you just said something that made me think about it. What are the chances this person or persons collected souvenirs? A memento of what they did, because it since well, there were things that weren't brought well, back, right? There was the brush from uh, the one Russian girl. books. Yeah. Some yeah. things were missing from some of them, right? I remember at least one from what Jill had in her backpack. Mm -hmm. The blanket was there. The books and brush were gone. Why was her know? backpack on her? That's that I forgot to talk about. You're right, Doug. That's Why a was damn good question. I had that written down and I forgot to get. To Why it. was it on her? Yeah. I have two scenarios in my head. First okay. one, first one, get dressed, get your backpack on. I'm taking you home. You're going home. Yep. Mm -hmm. That's the first one. The second one is just they were all discarded with all their clothing. They were redressed and discarded with the clothing to get rid of all the evidence at the same time. And that mm -hmm. could explain the haphazard dressing and not dressing properly. They just want to get out of there as fast as possible. So they're putting their clothes on. There's and a case. There's a case where two different victims were in the same van and put each other's clothes on accidentally. Um, I forget what case it was, but it's happened before where just in a haphazard manner to get out of there, they're just putting on whatever they can get on as fast as they can. And that mm -hmm. makes sense to, you know, maybe they didn't dress them. I, to, to me, it, it just seems weird that, you know, again, and again, I'm trying to get inside a killer's mind, but if you just want to toss them and get rid of them and get them out of your possession, just throw their clothes out in the water, out in the lake and throw them out in the lake, wherever. Why dr take the time to dress them? So it could mean they, they yeah. have some care for them yeah. or maybe they didn't dress them at all. I mean, it seems easier. They could have just put their bag clothes in a bag and burned it versus dressing them again. So I, I don't know. 
Well, I brought that up, right? And it's it's definitely a deliberate choice because particularly if they're dead, which why did I think that they were dressed after they were dead? <coughs> I don't know. As some, I think you said as some kind of giving back, like yeah. But I thought there was something forensic to that. Maybe I jumped the gun. I've got to go and look. Maybe that was it, right? I you know maybe it was get dressed. No, there were things, Alex. There were things in what you wrote where the kids wouldn't have dressed themselves like that. That was um... because the ribbon went in the back, not in the front. Yeah, yeah. yeah but again, yeah. if she's hurrying, yeah. maybe she's not taking the time. Right. Was... You know, maybe. But then you wait for them but to honest... dress in that stuff, and then you smother them, which is going to entail them lying down and all this. Well, you know, it's kind of weird. What if they are dressed when they're not being abused? Right. And so the time has come, they're dressed, they're not, you know, naked at that time. So it's the time has come to get rid of them and they're already dressed. Why are they dressed wrong then? Because they're traumatized or drugged or something? Maybe. You know, just don't give a shit. Yeah. Well, we don't have any evidence of drugs in the system. Um, but if her bow is turned around, I, I didn't come across that. Yeah. I mean, at least that's evidence the girl, that the girls had their clothes off. Mm. Oh, yes. Yeah. Of course that they did, yeah. Of course, yeah. because there's no evidence of sexual assault, right? So there's, well, always, but they yeah, there's no evidence of it, but it can happen in a more subtle way. Um, sure. This is but, where I'd like to ask Susanna too, and it's a shame she's not here. So obviously they're looking for rape kit stuff. They're looking for semen. They're looking for that kind of stuff. They didn't find it. Who's to say there's still not DNA on her body from the killer that they didn't know about back then searching right. for? Could they exhume the body at this point? And find potential DNA that wasn't collected back then. I wonder if Susanna has any thoughts on that. I'm sure she will. If they, they have, have any had, of their clothes. They would have had fiber evidence too, right? Like if the clothing. clothes came off, mm -hmm. they put down on something and then picked back up, there'd probably be... And there were fi fibers found on two of the victim's clothing. Okay. m back, m back. <laughs> m back commercial. Oh, yeah. Okay, so if we ever get to a point where we can do merch... I just want a t-shirt with a double helix on the back. And in the front, it just says MVAC it exclamation point. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, there is more to talk about with this. There's a, there's a lot to think through, but why? So yes, yeah, you're right. Practically get dressed. We're, we're taking you home or they just, when they weren't being sexually abused, they were redressed. Uh, I don't know why you would do that. Maybe to make them feel comfortable, but. Mm -hmm. Generally, when people keep someone in sexual slavery, they kind of keep them in a state of at least half undress, right? Easy access. You really want them to keep getting dressed and undressed. It's every also time. winter and it's freezing freaking cold mm -hmm. in Michigan. You're right. You're right. Uh, well, especially if it's not a residence. Let's say they bring them out of the house alive because they don't want to kill them in the house, whatever reason. So they, they're going to bring a naked kid outside? Probably not. So mm -hmm. you have to have them dressed to go outside. Then you kill them outside once they're out of your house. That so could be a reason. Go outside, though? I mean, you could, but it doesn't I mean, they, they definitely killed one of the kids outside the house. Why? Well, the shotgun. The shotgun. I'd like to yeah. look at that evidence, actually. Like, I'd like to really see how they arrived at that. Was that kid killed with that shotgun blast, or was it post-mortem? Because in the detective's theory, it was, uh, was post-mortem. Correct. So there should oh, be yeah. no signs of a pumping heart. Yeah, but I'm sure they would have found shotgun pellets and stuff like that there. They, did. they find all of them because some of them are going to be lodged in the kid's head, right? Yeah. I don't know the count or anything, but blood and pellets at the scene. And I've yeah. seen the photo of the scene and it's um, bloody as it would be if you shot somebody in the head. It's just a, a like a halo of you know, a pool of blood. And they could have killed him in the car. You know, especially if there's two of them, one of them could have sat in the back seat and reached could around have. and just could have. But it's kind of a weird thing to do after you've held them in mm -hmm. side for a long time. You think that you just yeah, but them in. but you unless you're going to carry a dead kid out of your house and you need them to walk out, you don't want them. To be no, no, no. Naked. You can throw a kid over your shoulder in a blanket. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's a small, it's a small bundle. I don't think they would have killed them in the car. I mean, they I were hastily so trying to get them out. They were driving down a highway and they were ditching them out the car. 
I don't think mm-hmm. they're going to take some time. To... Right. You don't, you don't want the kid no. to struggle. You don't, you, you know, exactly. the total control when they're in the house, that's where the pillows are. It's just much more likely, I think. Um, mm-hmm. So then are they dressed when they're killed with the pillow? Um, okay. Maybe dressed wrongly. I mean, I could see carry them out dead, but why take the time to dress them if you're going to do that? They were dressed before you killed them. Yeah. But, yeah. but they were dressed wrong. And that could be because of trauma, right? It could be because of, you know... They're just, rushing mm-hmm. to get their clothes on. Right. We know that one child was dressed incorrectly. Yeah. We don't it might not be the same for them all, right? Some might have been killed dressed. Some might have been killed undressed and mm-hmm. redressed later. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But like this sense of like, well, it just wouldn't be right to leave the kid out in public naked, right? And that's probably not or may not be the person that sodomizes them, but it may be someone else involved. Mm-hmm. The one good thing about this case is it seems like everybody's in agreement that these kids were all killed by the same person or persons mm-hmm. and not like one camp that says, oh, this is two different people. I think mm-hmm. everywhere I've read everybody seems to agree that this was the same killer or killers. With yeah. Four kids. If it wasn't for the location of the abductions, I would be pushing Lee more on linkage because you've got the gunshot case. That's very, very different because we don't know anything else. Um, and there is, you know, a conclusion that there was no sexual assault. Um, you got the different things done to the boys, possibly different things done with the girls. But then you come back to those locations and that location, you know, if this was a, a cases where these kids were from all over, abducted from various areas all over the suburbs of Detroit. But this is all along that Woodward Avenue thoroughfare. Mm-hmm. So that's what kept bringing me back to, yeah, these are connected. So I wonder if, and, and I go back to trying to get in the, Beside this person's mind is this guy cruising that area in his car is he grabbing coffee at the local coffee shop just drinking his coffee when he sees his kids is he looking out his front window when he sees his kids and sees an opportunity so i think he sees them from the street from somewhere he's out and about or they're out and about but it could be all of those things you know it's it's opportunistic this is what we do we hang out i mean take away the pornography ring You've got this area where south of, you know, down at the south end, more toward Detroit, you've got this pedophile alley called Cass Corridor. And they're all organized. They are all not like they are now on the Internet, but they were highly, highly organized. They knew each other. They had hierarchies. Um, And I think we talked about this, you know, in the Monster Florence case, the high level of organization of, of perverts. And, you know, this is also the area of the the era of the National Association of Man Boy Love. This was this was a movement. And so these guys, the way I see it, this is where they spend their time hanging out from Cass Corridor up and down Woodward Avenue, that whole area. And when they see it, a tasty kid, that's when they when they hit. But they're always looking. And that and that's exactly what trolling is, right? It's. Mm -hmm. It's the same as trolling for fish. If you're a fisherman and you troll, you know what time of year, you know what weather conditions, you know what lake or river to troll at what time of year, what kind of fish you're going to catch. And that it, it's the same concept here. And it's the same mm-hmm. way that serial killers who pick up hitchhikers like Ivan Milad or there's, you know, there's several other names you could throw out there is that they, they, they not only know exactly where those hitchhikers are because those hitchhikers are going to be where the the main roads are. They're going to be where the most likely places to get picked up are, where the most mm-hmm. successful areas are. So these the killers that pick up those hitchhikers, they know all that. They know the time of year the hitchhikers are out there. They know the weather conditions yep. the hitchhikers are out there. They know the routes the hitchhikers are out there. And yep. it's the same in this situation. You know, the, mm-hmm. And this person obviously knows a lot more about Woodward Avenue in 1977 than we do, but he's out there in, the, in those... You know, December to March months, he knows what those kids are doing. He knows what kids are like in that area at that time. And he knows Wednesdays, Sundays, for whatever reason, maybe it's his schedule. Maybe it's not his schedule. Maybe there's something mm-hmm. else about kids on those days in those areas. 
right? And he knows that maybe the 10 to 12 year olds like you were kind of getting to before morph is that, you know, maybe it, maybe that was that sweet spot of kids that were allowed to be on their own, but still impressionable, or maybe it was a sexual preference. I don't know, but you know, a lot or, yeah. Yeah. Something else is that the victims weren't street kids, like that were hanging out <clears throat> down on Woodward Avenue. Um, they weren't delinquents. So in terms of, you know, what you're talking about, Doug, and shopping, trolling, also knowing which victims are not street savvy. Ones that are going to call you out on your bullshit or run away or they're going to put up a fight. And you target a kid that is looks like a neighborhood kid as opposed to, you know, a street youth or somebody who's a little rougher that's hanging out on the streets. You've got yourself a more vulnerable, more gullible target. We all we also have to consider the person may have a badge, police uniform of some sort, yes. security uniform. Yes. Hey, I want to ask you a question about your friend Billy up the street got busted. Mm -hmm. Come here, I got a question to ask you. They lure them in like that. Yeah, and they're okay. This and is that like that's stranger. a theory that has been posed. Yeah. Um, just in terms of looking at the pedophile culture, um. Most of these Woodward Avenue, Cass Corridor types, they used drugs and alcohol and money to lure the kids in, getting them, you know, get them high. Let's watch a few movies, you know, very typical kind of street grooming stuff. Um, On the older victims you're but, talking about, like the 16-ish? No, no, Are no, no. Much no. older than that? Yes, yeah. 10. Wow, 10, wow. Re if you, okay, not that... It's not easy to stomach, but if you want a real good glimpse into, I would say at least the male on male child sex offenders, read uh, Wesley Allen Dodd's book because he goes into great detail. I'm sure a lot of it is probably bullshit, but on how exactly you go about getting, especially young boys to do this at a very, very young age. And what was surprising to me was how, and I do remember this from back in the 70s, how willing children were, especially boys, to engage in sex play with wow. each other. Um, and I remember it from the boys in my neighborhood. It was a very, very common thing. Wow. That see now to me, that 10 years old is kind of strange because I was into GI Joe's and uh that kind of stuff. I was I had no interest in any of that kind of stuff. Drinking nothing at that age oh, would, wow. would, yeah. would have interested me about that kind of stuff. So maybe those yeah, I, kids were exposed to something different. Or... I started drinking at 12. This was the 70s though, too. Um, but God, you must have been just a really good kid. I still am um, a good kid. <laughs> I get that. I totally get that from you, more. Um, he has a little staple but... under his arm. <laughs> I was a, I was a Cub Scout, so maybe that has something to do with it. You would have, yeah. You were a Cub Scout. That that has everything to do with it. No, I was a Cub Scout. I was pretty evil. Sometimes. Okay, that that kills my theory, <laughs> right there. Yeah, I bet your dog right. was in Scouts. I was. Uh, I'm not sure if I ever made it to Scouts. I was in Beavers. Maybe I did make it to Scouts. Campfire Girl. The only reason I joined was so I could go to horse camp every summer. I hated conformity, so I'm like, no, I don't like this. Well, yeah, I was in Cub Scouts. Sorry, that's not quite Scouts, is it? Yeah, Cub was, Scouts no, and then Boy Scouts because after Cub Scouts. Scouts. Yeah, Cub Scouts. Yeah, I was Beavers. in. Yeah, no, Weeblows. 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 Beavers is before Cub Scouts. Yeah, because Beavers, you had the beaver tail off your back of the hat. At least right. in Canada. That sounds like oh, a Canada. That sounds that's like a, a Canada Canadian thing. thing. Yeah. I don't remember that here in the States. No. Yeah. No. 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 Yeah. Wow. Well, guys, I'm going to have to sign off here. I I am too. We have a lot of yeah. stuff for the next couple of weeks. We episodes, do. We have a we lot of going, stuff to but... go through. Well, Doug, thank you. You've given me a lot of things. I'm going to be looking for those addresses and trying to pinpoint. Yeah. Some and the Sunday Wednesday thing is my time. big takeaway too. So yeah. I think you well, we'll get we'll get the citizen detectives involved. We can actually use them for this and we could even maybe get them to organize along some lines so they're not replicating each other's work that would be cool that'd be great okay. 
That's our that we'll put that out front next episode. Yep. Okie dokie. All Good right, night, everyone. everyone, and thank you All for right. being here. We'll see you in two, two weeks. weeks. Night, guys. Bye.